When I was a child, I was extremely afraid of the dark. I would go sleep on the floor of my parents' room, or sometimes my sister's, when the fear became too much for me. I think most kids are afraid of the dark to some extent. But I had experiences that caused the fear. I'd like to share one of the strangest experiences. My parents were divorced, so I only saw my dad every other weekend. My sister and I would usually go to his house together. And when I'd get scared, I'd go sleep on her floor. One particular weekend, I went by myself. There was something about that house that creeped me out, especially at night. It was bedtime and I was laying in my bed trying to ignore all the little creaks and noises of an old house and what sounded like footsteps. When the fear finally got to be too much, I had to go sleep on my dad's floor. I went to his bedroom door only to discover it was locked. I was so scared that I had to get in there no matter what. He had a door that could be unlocked with a penny. So I went back to my room to retrieve a coin so I could break in and sleep safely on his floor. I went across the hall to his door and went to unlock it when the handle started to turn slowly to the right and then to the left. I checked the handle again to find it was now unlocked. I thought maybe it was my dad, but when I opened the door, he was in bed sound asleep. He wouldn't have even had time to get from the door back to his bed that quickly. I ran back to my room and grabbed my pillow and blankets. And just as I left my room, the door behind me slammed shut. I was terrified at this point. The slamming door woke my dad up and I tried explaining what just happened. But he was irritated and didn't want to hear it. He told me to just lay down on his floor and go to sleep. So that's what I did. The next morning, I discovered that my bedroom door was locked from the inside. So not only did the door slam shut by itself, but it was also locked. Looking back on it, this experience, as terrifying as it was, seems benevolent. I was scared and wanted somewhere safe to go and the door to the safe place was unlocked for me, while the place I was terrified to be was closed off and locked. I'm someone who is always strongly skeptical of the paranormal. If friends tell me they have paranormal experiences in their house, I usually ask them if they have a carbon monoxide detector. However, there are a few experiences that I simply cannot explain, no matter what. I was sober for all of these experiences and had no symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. The weirdest one for me was a week where reality seemed to bend. Everything happened while I was driving. One night, I was driving to a coffee shop alone I had never been to before to attend a meeting. Following Google Maps, I pulled up to a three-way intersection that Google said was a four-way. It told me to go straight, but straight ahead, there was a chain link fence with a field behind it. There was a house with a large, very unique looking tree right next to the fence. I chalked it up to Google Maps making a mistake and turned so I could be rerouted. Right before I got to the coffee shop, someone walked out into the intersection in front of me on a green light and I had to slam on my brakes to avoid hitting them. I honked my horn. The person didn't seem to acknowledge me at all, just kept looking straight ahead. It was a very busy street, and so after I got through the intersection, I looked back and cars were barreling through the intersection, where the person should have been. The person was nowhere to be found. It was like I was the only person who saw them. I could still pick that person out of a lineup, five years later because it freaked me out so much. After the meeting, I used Google Maps to get me back on the highway and it took me by the house with the tree again. The problem was, what had been a field with a chain link fence was now a road, just like Google Maps had said. But the house with the tree was still there. So on top of it being the same intersection, something like 400W300S, it had a landmark 
which made it unmistakably the same place. The next day, I was driving and saw a car turn into another car in front of me. One car was on the road and the other turned onto it from a parking lot. The fronts of their cars were on the same place at the same time. It should have been an accident. I slowed my car down in anticipation, but the car that just got turned into didn't even put on their brake lights. We all pulled up to a red light and I had gotten into the left lane so I could pull up and see if the car had visible damage. There was none. The last part of this episode that made me question my sanity isn't explicitly paranormal, but because either happened the same week, it made me remember it. I saw a car going about 60 in a 30 zone towards the freeway by my house. I watched it go behind me and turn on the off ramp off the freeway and drive straight into op opposing traffic. The traffic didn't react at all. No horns, flashing lights, nothing. At least that I could see. The other three I had were all as a kid. The first, which I don't remember, was that I was sitting in the back seat of my mom's car, babbling, laughing, and talking to someone. My mom asked me who I was talking to, and I said, Grandma. She said, Grandma is in a city about five hours away. And I said, no, angel grandma with brown hair. My grandma with brown hair died before I was born, and no one had told me she existed. Granted, I was too young to remember, and I was coming from my grandpa's, my dead grandma's widower house so he could have said something but he swears he didn't the next also too young to remember was on a trip to virginia i was in the car and we drove by a church with a large steeple i said that's where all the sick people go my mom said no that's a church honey and i said no there's a sick people in there my mom out of curiosity goes into this church and asks if this was ever a hospital it turns out it had been made into a confederate hospital during the civil war. The last happened when I was about 12 years old. Me, my mom and my dog were all sitting in the living room, which lets us see into the kitchen. There was a small plate on the stove, about six inches from the edge, placed perfectly on top of the burner. I know because I put it there. All of a sudden, the plate flies across the room of about five feet. I saw the whole thing. The plate didn't fall, then skip. It came downwards at a diagonal angle, like it had been swatted. My dog, who was very mild-mannered and sweet, immediately starts aggressively barking. My mom and I just look at each other, and I say, did you see that? She just pauses for a minute and says, yeah. I spent about 10 minutes examining the stove in the kitchen but I couldn't find anything that could have caused it. The house did have a few mice, but it seems very unlikely that a mouse could have pushed a plate with this kind of force. Does anyone else have any kind of explanation for any of the experiences that happened to me? My father works on the night shift. So it's just me and my dog from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. Three days ago, my father asked me if I had gotten into his room, to which I replied no, because unless I'm cleaning around, I never get in and the door stays shut. He then asked me to walk in and show me an incense box he has on the top of his shelf, and told me that he found that on floor two consecutive days. It felt odd because the door is always closed and it obviously wasn't me, nor my dog. The next day, it wasn't the incense box. It was a rosary that he was hanging off a religious painting. It appeared across the room and today, it was a small bottle, an envelope and a small cross made with dry leaves that my dad keeps inside a flower vase. He thinks it could be me, unconsciously projecting some energy as I've been feeling really anxious lately, though my anxiety has been going for years. Or our late neighbour who passed away a month ago. The thing is, this is only happening in his room, so I do think it could be something trying to communicate with him. And the first person he thought of is our neighbour. 
It doesn't seem to be anything bad or aggressive, though I did hear some noise around our house a couple nights ago. I stay up until 6am because it's summer. Any suggestions on what to do? A friend of mine suggested using some salt in the room to cleanse it, but I honestly don't know. If someone needs help, I don't mind helping, but I don't want something bad to stick with us or me. I've had experiences in the past with noises, hearing someone call my name, hearing knocking inside my room, hearing doors close, but this time, it feels different. I'm 16 and live in a fairly ordinary, albeit reasonably affluent home in a fairly ordinary place. However, my family has a fair history of paranormal encounters. From my old home, which we used as a rental for tenants, where we had every single one of them complain and ask if the house is haunted, as they all saw a blonde woman with disheveled clothes walking around the kitchen. My family also has a thing for antiques. In our current home, we have about four ancient African head sculptures, along with Roman glasses that date before the time of Jesus Christ and so on. In my current house, strange things have happened for a very long time. However, they are far too many in number, and so therefore some have been forgotten and I also can't recount all of them. However, recently in particular, all in a similar time frame, very bizarre stuff has happened. This might be somewhat weird to explain. You know on the door, the slots where you slot the key in to lock it? The silver sort of thing surrounding the hole where the door is closed? Well, I assume most doors have it. The silver thing has randomly been bent at least 90 degrees backwards in the kitchen when entering it. Three times. Now, even though it makes no sense of my brother or dad to do this, and trust me, neither of them would play this sort of prank, and all of us showed visible concern. However, when we tried to bend it ourselves, we literally didn't have the strength to do it, and it took us a long time to get it back into place. The third time it happened, it was bent at a 45 degree angle. Really weird shit. Along with the unsolvable door case, four distinct things happened yesterday. Firstly, in the morning, I went into the kitchen and grabbed some vitamin Bs from a container. The tablets were jumbled between big ones and small ones, and so I poured some out, then separated two big ones and tried to put the small ones back. When doing this, a few of them fell on the floor. After I picked them up and stood up to get the big ones, they disappeared, nowhere to be seen. The second thing was my phone randomly disappearing and then being in a weird spot. The third is when I was sitting at the dinner table. I felt a screw underneath me. We assumed that it might have come from the table above the chair. However, upon examining it underneath, all screws were in place. The final weird event of yesterday was one of the weirdest. When it was around 12, I picked up my dog and put him in his cage. I say cage, but it's fairly big and takes up a large part of the kitchen. And upon doing so, locked the door. When I came back to the kitchen about 10 minutes later, the door was unlocked. However, my dog was laying down almost in a scared manner. A submissive manner is accurate. Two things, this lock is fairly sophisticated. It's impossible for my dog to open it. And secondly, my memory is sharp and I'm known for being fairly organized. Not to mention locking the cage after putting the dog in it is impulsive, automatic. You don't forget it. And thirdly, I know nobody went down there and played a trick on me as my brother and dad, at the time the only people home, were upstairs watching a movie with me after I joined them upstairs. So, my friend and I work together cleaning houses and businesses. We clean a large-ish city hall twice a week and something odd happened on Wednesday. 
I was mopping the big front entry hall and saw my friend quickly walk out of a little side hall on the end and into a room. I didn't think much of it at first and kept mopping. Not even a minute later, I looked down another hallway, which isn't connected to that other hall at all, and saw her looking for something on the supply cart to clean the little bathrooms. Cue utter confusion. At first I thought that maybe someone else was in the building, but realised no, that was definitely my friend that I had just seen. I kind of slowly walked toward the room and found it to be empty. I shut off the light and closed the door. I didn't tell my friend about it and chalked it up to my eyes playing tricks on me. Today, we went back to clean and I ended up telling her about it. Her eyes got wide and she told me that she had seen something very similar on that same day. She said she was coming out of the janitor's closet and saw me turning the corner at one end of the hall, going into the large main hallway. She called out for me to tell me something, but I didn't turn around or acknowledge her. She ran toward the main hall and I was gone. At that moment, she heard me opening a door behind her at the opposite end of the hall, saying something about the plants. I even remember this. I'd been back in the officers dusting and noticed the dead leaves on their plants looked glittery and wanted to tell her about it. When I found her, she was at the end of that hall looking around. I remember she looked kind of confused, but she didn't mention it either. There's a lot of hallways. I hope that wasn't confusing. The point being, there was no way either of us could have been where we thought we saw each other. Weird things. For some background before I get started, me and my parents moved into a house back in 2008. Unknown to me at the time, as an 8 to 10 year old, a girl had drowned our bathtub months prior to us moving in. She took muscle relaxers, slipped under. This took place several years ago, when I was 11 to 13 years old, I'm 22 now. I was a child that struggled with severe insomnia and was on some really strong sleeping pills because without them, I couldn't get a wink. I always kept my pill bottle in the bathroom so I could take them before bed. It was a normal day. I'd been playing outside most of the day, getting into who knows what and just being a kid. It was time to come inside as it was getting late and my parents wanted to make sure I ate and drank something. I had problems eating and drinking. Fast forward after dinner, it was time to take my medicine, so I would be tired as heck for bed. I go to the bathroom and my pill bottle is gone. I thought it fell on the floor, but it was nowhere to be found. Me and my parents tore the house apart looking for my medicine bottle, but to no avail. It was hard, sleepless nights after that. Fast forward about three months, me and my dad were replacing electrical wiring in the attic and I was the only one small enough to get into the far corner to slide a wire down into the ceiling to my dad. I looked around at the insulation and saw something white and covered in dust. My curiosity peaked and I crawled over to the wood boards and I quickly realised it was my medicine bottle that had gone missing months prior. My parents were grasping at straws and baffled at how it ended up in the attic. But at this point, I'd overcome my insomnia and no longer needed the pills. This was only the beginning of things I would experience over the years, living in a haunted house. I worked for a haunt walk tour in Upper Michigan. Most of the time, we didn't experience anything on the tours, and we had to hype not exactly true stories that would happen on the tour. What I'm about to scroll out for you is true, and it scared the hell out of me. I befriended one of the tour guides, and we often went on little ghost hunts because we were bored. We used all the fun tech on our ventures. Friends from Illinois were visiting, and I knew one of them was into the paranormal. 
I ask the tour guide to take us on a private tour. We hit up most of the local hotspots, and when we were passing the cemetery, I told them about the tombstone of a friend that I frequently visited, just to unload my worldly burdens onto. The tour guide asked if he wanted to see if he would talk back. We settled near the stone and were using a hack shack, or shack hack, can't remember what it's called, to communicate. We finally heard my name. The tour guide was constantly scanning the area for temperature drops. About 20 feet away was a drop of temperature. The spot was 40. It was the middle of summer. I was instructed to take the ghost box and stand in the area. As I did, the voice became clearer. After about five minutes, I felt a cold step on my foot, and then it turned into a normal 75 degree night. After that night, I was tortured by terrible nightmares that would happen on a two week basis. I can't tell you what they were about because it happened when I was a teen, but I do remember they didn't stop until I went back to the graveyard. My friend informed me that what I was speaking to was not the spirit of a daily departed, but that of one of three demonic presences of the area. He explained to me that ghosts don't typically haunt graveyards. The next couple weeks were rough. My mental health had declined. I was fighting with my parents. My friends had distracted themselves from me and my significant other and I broke up. The tour guide friend and I would go to the outskirts of the graveyard with his lover. Note, I didn't know they were sleeping together at this time and all the equipment. We made it a point not to enter the graveyard again. We were 30 minutes in until the lover suggested he had heard the location of the tour guide's apartment. Just like my other friends, they had abandoned me. The next years, I moved around a lot, affecting my mental and physical health. When I went back to the graveyard next, it was to bury my father in 2017. Afterwards, I had this feeling of warmth and as if a great weight was off my shoulders. I remain friends with the tour guide and we talk every now and then. I'm doing a lot better. I've got a great job and a fantastic fiance. I'm healthy and have surrounded myself with people who love and support me. I don't often talk about when weird stuff happens around me. I find when I do, the frequency of the occurrences increases and that is not fun. But this latest event was unnerving and I just need to get it off my chest. My house is one of those old hoses in Chicago, built in the 1880s for workers, probably the meat packing industry. It's so old, the pillars supporting the house are literally tree trunks. Everything creaks. The wood floors are so noisy that they wake up the baby if one of us walks by her bedroom. It's a bit run down, but it's generally a warm and happy home. We've lived here almost four years. That being said, there are still occasionally loud, terrifying thumping noises with no explanation and random uncomfortable feelings or events. Two mornings ago was the worst event I've experienced. It was one of my days off and my wife had taken the baby out for a walk with her friend. That meant I could go back to bed, play games on my phone and take a little nap. As I was finally ready to drift off, one of the baby's electronic toys went off in the living room. It was one of those tiny tables that has a bunch of buttons and things to press, then plays little sounds and songs. It has maybe 20 buttons. So it goes off and I try to ignore it, telling myself that one of the cats bumped it. I know they didn't because they are noisy little chunks, but I like to pretend these things anyway. A minute later, the damn table makes a different noise. Different noise, different button. I continue to ignore it and try to fall asleep, but sleep quickly becomes impossible. The sound keeps coming at a random intervals, as if trying to get me to respond. But I'm good at this game and pretend like I don't even hear it. After maybe 15 minutes, it seems like things have calmed down. My nap though is not going to happen. The thing got to me. At that point, I was freaked out enough that I let my mask slip 
and pull the sheets over my head like I was seven years old again. Immediately, and I mean the moment after I had the sheets over my head, the table starts up again. Only this time, it's not just a button being pressed, the button was being held down, the sounds repeating over and over again. I bunker down and ignore it, figuring I could wait this out like I did the others. Those times it stopped fairly quickly. Not this time. It goes on for more than a minute. I debate trying to wait it out, but I don't want my family to come home and find me cowering under a sheet while our daughter's toy mocks me from another room. Not because I care about them seeming brave. My wife knows who I am. I just don't want whatever it was able to feed off their reactions as well as mine. So I get up, calmly walk to the living room, turn the toy off and return to my bed to cower under my blankets until my wife comes home to rescue me. I'm just glad the thing hasn't turned itself back on. In high school, I worked at a family fun park, go-karts, batting cages, laser tag. One day at work, I was working outside on the go-kart track. One of my co-workers came outside and asked if I had seen this creepy little girl that looks straight out of a horror movie. They said she had very pale skin, long black hair, and was wearing a white dress. My co-worker was joking about how scary and unsettling she looks. The park really isn't that big, and I didn't see anyone like that. Creepy little girls are actually one of my biggest fears, so I'm telling her to quit with this story, and she's insisting that it's true. Another one of my co-workers comes out now, talking about the girl too. Those two female co-workers were best friends and would mess with other employees a lot, so I wrote it off as one of their stupid jokes. Fast forward about an hour later maybe. Now I'm working inside at the laser tag. This boy, maybe about 10 years old, comes out of the laser tag crying. He runs to his dad and starts talking to him. His dad comes over and he says his son was attacked in the laser tag area by a girl. The story he said was that a girl screamed at him, then charged him and started scratching him. I noticed then that the little boy is bleeding. He has a look that is a combination of pure horror and a thousand yard stare. His dad also seems to be very concerned as well. His son was very frightened. I asked him what the person looked like. He said a girl with long black hair and a white dress. I sent the two of them up front to get a band-aid. I was the only one working the laser tag so I couldn't go in there or else I would leave the entrance unattended and my boss would not be happy about that. There were still a few people inside playing laser tag. Two minutes later they come out. I asked them if they saw the girl and they all said no. I closed the entrance of the laser tag, blocked it with a rope and went inside. I literally am clearing this laser tag area like a SWAT team. Every corner I take is fast and I'm ready to punch the fuck out of anyone trying to jump at me. I spend a few minutes inside. There's nobody there. Either she left out of the fire escape, it doesn't set off an alarm, or she left out of the front when I was clearing the laser tag and our paths didn't cross on her way out. The rest of the day passes without incident. I tell my co-workers about the girl. The two girls from before are chiding me because I doubted them earlier. I'm back outside at the go-karts. Right before my shift is up, I see her. She's standing outside the fence in the parking lot. White dress, black hair, very pale skin. Like the girl from the ring except not a corpse. She's in a parking lot, smiling, crying. Smiling, crying. Repeated back and forth, crying followed by a sadistic-like smile. Eventually, she walks off into the distance. I don't know where she went. I know she didn't have any parents or anyone with her when she left. What do you think was going on? An elaborate prank? I don't think the boy and his dad were faking. He definitely got scratched hard. Some sort of mentally sick, unsupervised child? Some sort of weird ass demon child? 
It's still something I think of every so often. When I was younger, my favorite cousin and I used to frequently have sleepovers. I used to be a huge scary cat, always on edge and easily frightened. So whenever we had the sleepovers, we would sleep together in one bed. My cousin's bed faced her bedroom door that was always left open at night. All you could see at night was the empty dark kitchen, which I hated, meaning I would sleep on the side of the bed, facing the wall instead. My cousin and I would joke around and laugh until we grew tired and fell asleep watching something on TV. I've always been an early bird. I'd be up by 6 a.m. and force my cousin to wake up at that time. But for some odd reason, this time I had decided to let her sleep for a little while more. I have no idea why, but I decided to turn around and stare out into the empty quiet kitchen while debating how I was going to crawl over my cousin to get up to use the bathroom. And suddenly, I saw a big, long, shadowy figure walk past the doorway of the room. I froze in horror. I felt my body immediately shut down in fear, but it was very early and it was still a bit dark, so I tried to dismiss it as me seeing things. Until recently, when I was telling my cousin this story, and she's told me that she was also awake at that time and had also seen the long, dark, shadowy figure pass the doorway. I don't know whether to feel relieved that I wasn't the only one seeing things or scared that she saw it as well. When I was younger, my dad's side of the family, almost every year, would all go on vacation to Mexico to the small ranch they grew up in. It's fun for my cousins and me since we would all spend time together and play all day until the sun started to go down in fear of seeing La Llorona, the wailing, weeping woman. In case you aren't aware, there is a Mexican urban legend that late at night near bodies of water, a wailing woman crying, where are my children? will appear looking for the children she drowned. And if she sees a child, she'll take them or drown them. My grandmother's house, which we usually stayed at, was at the edge of the ranch. So after my grandma's house, there was just a huge space and a road that would take you to the next neighboring ranch, which was roughly half an hour car ride. It was very rare to see a person walking unless they were on a horse, if it wasn't a car. So at night, it would get pitch black unless the moon was out. Almost right next to her house, a stream passed right next to her house, which then dropped into a small waterfall. We would play there all day until the sun was going down. We would dash out there, not wanting to get dragged by La Luana. One night, for some reason, my cousins and I got bold and decided that we wanted to see La Luana and finally conclude whether or not she was real. We all gathered at the front of my grandmother's house and marched our way to the stream. The first few minutes, we stood right next to the stream, calling for her, and would remain quiet and scared, not wanting to miss if she cried out. But after a while of waiting, we got tired and started joking and cracking jokes about La Llorona. Suddenly, we all heard a loud wail making us stay completely quiet in fear. My cousins and I screamed and ran back into my grandma's house, where to our horror, we found all of our parents inside having coffee. We were all hoping it was maybe one of our parents playing a trick on us, but they were all inside chatting. We never mentioned it to our parents at that point, because we would all get in trouble for being near the stream at night. But my cousins and I still don't know who or what made that sound that night. I still get chills remembering how horrifying that whale was. I had an experience when I was 10. I was cleaning my room when one of the action figures on my shelf fell over. It wasn't a natural fall either, but I thought it was probably my elbow. The same day, 
I had a friend over and I was telling them about the figure falling over. Not that we weren't near the shelf at the time of our conversation. I explained to them how I thought, what if it was a ghost? And everything, and as soon as I said it fell over, the figure fell over in the same unnatural way. We both ran out of the room, understandably. And later that day, they told me that they thought it was making it up until it fell over. The second experience was when I felt a figure sitting on a chair. I remember them wearing early 20th century clothes. I thought it was my imagination and thought the same thing. It must be my imagination. He's not real, yada yada. Right after, I thought that I, it like was first punched the shutters. The window was closed. Even if it was the wind, the entire shutter would fold. But it was only one side of the shutter that got hit and was shaking. I'm not the type of person who has dreams or lucid dreams. However, maybe a week and a half or two into August, I was sleeping. Not sure if I had dreamt. If I did, it was very short dreams. But anyways, a huge loud voice woke me up out of my sleep. I recognized the voice too. It was my mom's voice. She called me two times, but the voice was so loud. I woke up frightened and thought she was at my door room. I woke up and my mom wasn't there or any of the family members. So I laid in my bed thinking like, what the fuck? So I replayed the voice over in my head, trying to understand it or what it meant. Because the voice I heard while sleeping sounded sad, hurt and scared. So I went downstairs to speak to my mom about her coming upstairs to my room calling me, which the answer was no. So I kept thinking, did that voice mean anything or only a dream? So I got a huge bad feeling. Something told me someone in the family was going to die. I don't know who or when, but something fucking told me. I kept that to myself. Now the most shocking and most unreal feeling happened to me. The following week of August of 2021, which happened a few days ago, I lost the mother of my child in a very bad car accident. The worst news I ever got in my life. When I got the news, how could you not? I was in my room and my mom ran to my door, banging on it, and was calling my name the same way when I was sleeping. She broke down in tears, saying she died, she died. I was so shocked and lost that my body filled up with goosebumps with a weak feeling. Because the first thing that came to mind was my dream when I woke up from hearing that voice sounding like my mom. All I know is that life is weird to the point I don't understand how it is. I lost the mother to my child and my daughter will not have a mother to grow up with. Shit hurts so much. I just can't expect it and fully, I'm fully denying it. So angry at hurt by it. I feel so sorry for my daughter as well. The best thing I can do is try my best to give her a better life and step up even harder to be a better father. Please spend time with your loved ones and make sure you know that blissful love because life works in mysterious ways and we shouldn't wait until death to show love. Background. Me? My older sister, father and family dog, moved to a house when I was 10, and my sister 14. The moving day was the first time I stepped into the house, and immediately I felt uncomfortable. Weird things started to happen almost immediately. Night after night, a man would visit my room, and each night, he got closer. Our rooms were all along the hallway and my door was always the only one open in case of fire or something. This went on for months. Then one night, the man sat next to me on my bed. I was facing a wall and could hear my dad snoring from the end of the hallway bedroom. The man crouched next to my ear. I felt his breathing and suddenly, he just whispered my name. I jumped up, burst out crying, and ran to my sister's room. 
She woke up and asked what happened. While crying, I told her about the man who visited me every night and how he finally said my name. I was scared shitless. I slept in her room that night. There was a time when I lived with my mom, but when I moved back with my dad when I was around 15, just the two of us lived there. Sister moved to her own place. During the few years I lived there again, I found out by Ouija board and interacting with them that with us lived the man, an old lady and a little boy. I talked with the man almost daily and asked him why he was scaring me when I was little. He told me that he was just checking if I was all right and that when he lived, he had two daughters around the same age my sister and I were. He just wanted to make sure I was all right and unharmed. He also told me he was scared of my dad and wanted to protect me from him. The man also kept the old lady in her place and prevented her from tormenting us. We lived together with my dad and the ghosts for a few years. Then I moved back with my mom for a year. Now, I live in my own place, a few short streets from my father's house where he lives alone with the ghosts. Weird things have happened a few times in my apartment, such as someone turning my shower on for a few seconds and then turning it off and turning lights on and off, things going missing and reappearing. Could it be possible that the man who swore to protect me comes to visit me every now and then? Weird things happen only if I haven't visited my dad in a long period of time, like a few weeks to a month or two. But if I miss visit my dad every now and then, then nothing happens. P.S. My sister said that someone kept visiting my room after I moved out the first time. That's when she started to believe me. Someone also stood at her doorway, but never went into the room. Our family dog always went crazy when that happened. And my father, after years, told me that he knew the place was haunted and knew what I told him was true. But he didn't want to scare a 10-year-old me. So for the last couple of weeks, maybe a little over a month, I've been seeing my dog in places that she wasn't. Like, I see her upstairs in the kitchen when I know for a fact she was downstairs in the basement and there's no way she could have snuck past me on the stairs. This has been happening almost daily, multiple times a day, any time of day. The first time this happened was July 18th. It was noon and I had just let my dog back inside after I took her out. Normally she walks off to wherever this time. She went to her cage to drink some water. I could see her lapping at her water bottle as I walked to my room. Again, I could hear her getting water. So when I walked into my room, I see her laying next to my bed, just looking at me. Again, I know my dog, so there was no way some random dog walked into my house and got comfortable that just so happens to look like her. I call her name asking how she got in here before me. At that point, I'm slightly on edge because it's just not possible. In response to me calling out her name, she comes to my door and barks softly. When I turned to look at her and back to what I saw, it's gone. Another time, this is during the day again, my dog is laying in her bed asleep or half asleep. Now her bed is in sight of where I'm at in the kitchen due to us having a half wall. I'm on FaceTime with a friend and I have my phone propped up in front of me. It's on a small shelf, which is a bit higher than me, so it gives a perfect view of the doorway to the living room. Now my dog is in front of me, laying down, and I ruffle a bag which accidentally gets her attention. Due to where my phone is, my friend can't see my dog come in from the den into the kitchen. I see her and at first she sits by my leg, begging, thinking, I have a snack of some food. But then my friend greets my dog now. First of all, my friend can't see my dog due to my phone being on the shelf slightly above me. There's no way she can see my lower body. And my dog isn't big in the slightest. She's a medium sized dog. Secondly, I'm looking dead at my dog 
So at that point, I have chills. And I ask her, how can her, she's right there by my leg. My dog faces the doorway to the living room and I follow her gaze as my friend says, no, she's right there behind you. Now my dog just stares at it and I quickly grab my phone and show my friend my dog is right here. I know I'm not crazy or my mind is playing tricks on me because I'm not the only one this has happened to. We only have one dog. She's very hard to miss and easily identifiable by her having white fur, combing her right paw, almost like she's wearing her sock. And this lookalike looks the exact same way. I've unintentionally interacted with several times, like called at my dog's name in confusion. It doesn't do anything, but look at me or whomever encounters it. I'm not the only one in the house this has happened to. I don't know what it is or why it's here. Girlfriend and I are both 23 years old. We purchased our first home back in February and have been moved in for about four months now. We've both had paranormal experiences in the past. My girlfriend's in relation to her grandmother passing and mine occurring at multiple stages in my life in multiple different forms and with seemingly multiple different intentions. Now here's the situation. When we initially moved in, there were no problems. It was all good. After about a month, we adopted a one-year-old cat, all black, Salem. Still, things were fairly normal. Maybe the odd occurrence here or there, but we reasoned it to be that we got a new cat and weren't used to him living in the home yet. So weird sounds and sightings were most likely just him. About a month ago, we adopted a second cat, also one-year-old and also black, Selena. This is when we started noticing more strange things happening. It started with black shadows. I've seen these before many times in my life, just usually larger. These shadows are small, almost creature-like instead of human-like. We started seeing them out of the corner of our eyes, perched on ledges, chairs, tables, couches, etc. Well, after a few weeks, the shadows became more mobile. We began seeing them move past our feet while standing in the house, run past our legs while going up the stairs, jump off a seat when we go to sit down, etc. Well, the other day, I experienced an aspiration. We recently redid our bedroom, new paint, new trim, etc. I was putting our stuff back in the closet after the remodel when I saw a cat, not a shadow, but a cat sitting on top of my safe in the back of our closet. Typically, I don't do double takes. I've learned in my life that there's no point. It won't still be there, but this time I did. Being a full on cat and not just a shadow or weird figure. Of course, when I looked again, it was gone. My girlfriend was in the room and noticed me do this, so I had to explain it. The cats appeared all black, just like our kitties. But our cats have yellow or gold eyes. They're Bombay cats. This one's eyes were white. And not like the white of a human's eyes, no, but like a white light on a foggy night. Almost as if they were glowing, but without actually giving off any visible light. And no pupils that I noticed. It seems like a lot to have gathered from a quick glance, but we've been picking up on this entity for a good few weeks now. And the image of that cat in my closet is vivid in my mind. On top of this, my girlfriend has recently been experiencing a borrower's phenomenon, specifically with her vapes. She owns three of the same vapes. Just about a month ago, one of them went missing. A week or so later, so did a second. She's been using the third, which doesn't work very well. Last week, I overheard her ask aloud if anything had taken her vapes to please return them and take the less functional one in their place. Well, later that night, we had to run out. My girlfriend grabbed a shirt out of a spare closet in the spare bedroom, a closet that has been untouched since we moved in. She didn't end up wearing the shirt and placed it on her makeup table. 
Again, this closet and shirts have been untouched for four months. When we arrived home later that evening, we found the vape she had been using, the third less functional one, to be missing, along with the other two. But then, there it was, wrapped up inside that shirt that hadn't been touched in four months and had been hanging in a closet. Was the original vape that went missing battery dead? A few hours later, we found the second vape in an obvious location. The third vape that went missing when those two returned, it's still missing. It's like whatever had taken those two vapes felt bad and genuinely replaced them and took the less functional one instead. We're starting to believe that the cat lives within the crawl space in our basements. To explain, our home is a split level. Under the living room is a four foot tall crawl space. Under the rest of the house are full eight foot basements. The crawl space is accessible through a full sized door in the basement. This used to be Salem's and still is favorite place in the home. But he treats it differently now. Originally, we would let him in and he would stay and play or nap in there for hours. Now when we let him in, he goes in, goes to the very back corner only for a few minutes and then leaves and begins playing with his toys in the basement instead of the crawl space. But it's different. It's like he's playing with something else, not just him and his little mouse toys. It's strange because I'm not joking, it's his favorite place. He will go stand in front of that door and meow non-stop to be let inside. He loves it, but he no longer sticks around like he used to. It's almost as if he's going in there for something. Like he's asking, please can you let my friend out to play? Not, please can I go inside and play? So far, this entity has not brought any malicious behavior with it. No mischief and accidents have not increased. Our animal's behavior hasn't changed. Our house plants are very healthy, etc. The only perhaps mischievous behavior is the disappearance of the vapes. However, when requested that the vapes be returned and that the less functional one be taken, just that happened. This makes me want to believe that this entity does not mean harm, but is simply trying to peacefully coexist with us. The reason I am hesitant is because I know, and partially from experience, that entities will disguise themselves. Larger demons and poltergeists may disguise themselves as lesser entities, specifically ones they know you will take kindly to, as an attempt to earn your trust, as well as grow stronger. We have been trying to avoid acknowledging this entity within the home, just in case, as I said, it is a higher entity in disguise as a lesser entity. We do not want it to gain power from our acknowledgement or acceptance. That said, so far it has given no hints of being a malicious entity, other than the vape disappearance, but it cooperated with us on that endeavor. I would also like to think that if it were a malicious entity, our cats would pick up on this, most specifically Salem, the one who we believe has befriended the spirit's cat. I also have, on only a couple occasions, seen a larger shadow entity. This one, human-sized. However, most of the time there was also a tall lamp, chair covered in clothes, etc., sitting next to where I saw the humanoid entity. So I've just assumed this one to be my mind playing tricks on me. I guess it could possibly spirit cat's owner, or possibly spirit cat's true form. I'm less concerned about this figure though, as again, I think it was just my imagination. I apologize for the long story, but I just need some advice. Does anyone see any potential that this may be a more powerful entity, attempting to gain our trust and eventually cause harm? I mean, I can't imagine a spirit's cat would have any interest in a nicotine vape. The disappearance slash reappearance of these items is the only thing still boggling my mind, especially since her original vape returned with only a couple hours of her asking, and as stated, returned wrapped up in a shirt that had been unworn for four months and hanging in a closet. It's like whatever returned the vape knew she would find it in that shirt. She went to hang it up later. 
I believe we're doing the correct thing by not acknowledging it. And to be honest, even once we're confident it is just a simple cat, I'm not sure we will ever truly acknowledge it. I've experienced what can happen in the past by doing so, not only with the entity at hand, but with entities who may be nearby waiting as well. Acknowledging or accepting beings from the other realms always comes with a long list of risks. My main concern is whether there is risk by not attempting to get rid of it. I'd also like to know if anyone sees my cats as possibly being at risk. Salem, the cat we believe to have befriended, the spirit cat, is the best cat I've ever met. He's loving, affectionate, kind and respectful of our home. He would never damage anything or do anything that he thought would upset us. He waits at the door for us when we come home from work, sleeps in between us at night. I just haven't ever met a cat like him, and I would be beyond devastated if something were to happen to him, the hands of this shadow cat entity, or whatever it might be. I'm a moderately typical teenager from Japan, male. Ever since I can remember, I have throughout my lifetime had recurring encounters with some strange people, be it in terms of looks or behavior. These encounters can happen anywhere from a week's space to several months, and it always seems like when I do, it was their intention to meet me. My most recent one was on my way home from school. During my walk, I was looking down at my phone for a short moment about to text one of my friends I planned to have over at my house later. As I walked, looked up, a young man looking like he was in his twenties was approaching me a few meters ahead. This confused me for a minute as it was a straight and fairly long path ahead. I thought to myself that while I may have been looking at my phone, I would surely have noticed him coming from the corner of the path a good length away, or at least I expected him to be closer to that corner, but there he was, approaching from the middle, as if he had appeared from thin air. His hair was dark brown, a bit unkempt but still good looking, and he had green eyes. His clothes were fairly ordinary too, keeping a sort of laid back summer style to it. The most remarkable thing about him was his tattoo, or mark per se, a black line running from his left chin and down underneath his shirt. As he got close enough for a conversation, he stopped me and asked for my name. When I told him, he said that he'd heard about me before. This confused me as I'm not exactly a celebrity, but I thought nothing more of it. We then had some boring small talk, but he genuinely seemed pretty cheerful. Just as he was about to take off, he told me that I should probably wait for my friend. He didn't give me much of a chance to respond to this before walking off in the direction he came from. I thought about what he said and turned around to walk back to school. I glanced behind my back, but not long after, only to find that he was nowhere to be seen. As I made it back to my school, I sure enough found my friend waiting by the gate. She apparently thought we were going to walk to my place together and had been waiting for me for quite a long time. I apologized and we began walking, and well, that's the end of it. I didn't tell her about the encounter, but I thought about it when she left. I didn't tell him or hint about my friend at all, so how would he have known? These types of encounters have kept on happening throughout my life, sometimes very frequently, and I don't know why. These people I meet just seem too unreal and usually know something I never told them about. Which leads me to believe these people aren't human at all. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we used to communicate that we are safe at the top of the roots are, name of the guy on the ground, off belay. 
which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is name of guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on a 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what I thought was going on. Then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground, like close enough we would have had a shouting conversation, and way further left off route of where the climber should have been, it said, Tommy Sticks, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the fuck was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving, but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope started moving again, later followed by a faint syllable countered, Tommy Sticks off belay. This sounded way more like what it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears a voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to try to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. Is there a specific cryptid that mimics the voice of a person? This happened when I was only about six or seven years old, but it's burned into my memory. I still remember exactly what the rooms looked like. And unfortunately, due to some mental illnesses I have, memory issues and don't remember much of my life at all, except a general idea of what's happened. But this, this I remember. I grew up in central Georgia. I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Macon at the time and would come for a big family visit from my dad's side. There was an absolutely beautiful two-story abandoned house next door. It was old, very old. Us kids always were creeped out by it and said it was haunted. We even saw shadow figures in the windows and the curtains move. Well, the family decided to go explore it. I wasn't particularly excited. We go inside and it's gorgeous and still fully furnished. There's a stairwell up to the second story. It's enclosed with two doors halfway up. No landing and directly across from each other. My whole family heads all the way upstairs while one cousin stays downstairs. Me and my other older decided to check out the door on the left. It's a library, a fancy one. It smells like mildew and old books. We walk around looking for a few minutes and suddenly start hearing loud whispering. I don't know how else to explain it. It's coming from the stairwell or, or the room. It's not our family. We can also hear them. So we open the door to the opposite room. It was a bathroom with a claw foot tub. My cousin walks in first with me peeping around behind her. I'll never forget what we saw next. There were two skeletons laying foot to head in the empty tub, whispering to each other. We froze for a second until they both turned and looked at us. My cousin immediately threw me over her shoulder and ran fast as hell back to our aunts. We never told them what we saw, but my oldest cousin asked why we were whispering and was very confused when we told her we weren't. All the adults just felt generally creeped out. This will probably be relatively short, as there's only been a few occurrences. There's a bathroom door in my house you can never completely open. You can open this all the way, 
only for it to swing back to about halfway open. When it, once it reaches this position, it doesn't swing back and forth, just rests. I don't believe it's due to an offset door, as it's only been happening the past couple months. There's also a sink that has a touch sensor, and while I was putting away dishes, it came on suddenly. This, of course, could have just been a glitch, but it has happened maybe two or three times. Another time, when I was doing something not so smart, aka standing on a counter, I fell back and landed on an open dishwasher and happened to land on the silverware basket. This had forks and knives facing upwards, but I had not a single mark on my legs. A bad choice I also made was trying to swallow a pretty large marshmallow whole. At first, I was fine, but it of course got stuck and I started choking. I tried just calmly walking to the kitchen to get water, and almost there I fell and couldn't get back up. By some miracle, it finally managed its way down, and I spent a while just sitting on the floor confused. I don't know how or why it came unstuck, or why most of these besides the door have happened in the kitchen. So, I'm 18 male, and this just happened. I live in a two-story house, and my room is adjacent to a room that's in turn has a balcony which has plants and stuff. I grow a shit ton of plants. I usually fumble around them at night before going to a sleep. The balcony overlooks a part of our lawn that has a circular walkway around it, and usually, my dad takes nighttime strolls in the garden, just to clear up for the night. There's a row of five windows and a door in the adjacent room, all glass and wood, and each with their respective mosquito net doors. They look into the balcony as they connect my room's adjacent one to the balcony. My dad was walking outside. Anyone on the lawn can actually see if someone's at the balcony or the window. Right now, just before my dad asked, why were you standing at the door on the balcony? You've got exams. Keep your mind off your plants. Don't loiter around plants at night. I wasn't. I usually do visit plants on my balcony before sleeping. But today, I hadn't gone to the balcony. I was in my room studying. My mom was downstairs watching TV and my dad was outside strolling. We don't have anyone else living in my house. And we live in a very quiet and wooded street. On the 1st of June 2008, I moved with my children into a big old farmhouse in the country. This old house was beautiful, high ceilings and lots of room for all the children to play. From the very first visit, strange things happened. My youngest, who was a toddler at the time, was laying on the lobby floor and she was playing with something that was making her giggle. Her hands were straight up in the air and she was talking with it. She pointed up at the ceiling and said, look at it, mummy. I was freaked completely out. I was in a hurry and had to get more boxes moved, so huddled the three youngest into the car. As I drove up the old private road, my youngest kept waving out her side of the window, laughing and saying, I'll be back, I'll be back. I watched her through my mirror, but only stopped the car when her brother and sister got freaked out. I asked her gently, who are you talking to? She replied, little girl. I was spooked enough, but then she said, she wants me to stay and play. I had no doubts that she saw something and was playing. She seemed happy and unafraid though. The others were scared at the time. This was the first of many things that happened in that old house and its grounds. It was a bright sunny day. The rays were streaming through the windows lighting the house up, making the place look wonderful. My husband was in Australia at the time, and so I logged on the internet and was chatting via webcam with him. He was smiling and waving. He pointed and was saying, hi, to what he thought was my daughter. I said to him, who are you talking to? They're all upstairs playing. He was laughing and continued to wave, saying, 
She's behind you and is now hiding. I looked around and returned to the camp, replied with goosebumps, No one's there. He pointed again and said, Shh, she's gone into that room behind you. I said, That door is closed. But anyway, got up and opened the door, looked around the room, came back out and said, No one is there. My husband was adamant he saw a little girl and admitted he could not see her clearly, but acknowledged it resembled my daughter, who was about eight years old at the time. Now, me being the way I am, proceeded to go up to the old windy stairs and could hear all of the children playing. The older lads are on their PlayStation and the youngest three were in the girls' room playing with cards and trying to unravel their slinkies. I asked all of them had they been downstairs, even though I knew I would have heard them coming. They all said no, and to be completely frank, they were all engrossed with what they were doing. I went back to the computer and told my husband, no, no one there, everyone's upstairs. He swears to me to this day, he saw a little girl with long hair, wearing a white dress, standing behind me, peeking as if she was shy. My husband's a skeptic, but he's adamant he saw a girl. After we moved in, there was this horrible smell that I just couldn't get rid of and seemed worse some days than others. The children thought it was the upstairs bathroom, but I believed and told them it was just the farm type smells that knew this smell was rancid and not the usual smell that you would get from the farm. I went through the house bit by bit, sniffing everywhere, and then after a while, I found exactly where it was coming from. It was a section of the floor. There were new carpets put down and no stains or accidents, etc. Well, one day when I was in the village, I had a conversation with an old fisherman who had lived in that area all of his life, and he got to quizzing me about how I liked the place. I was honest and told him it's great, but the smell from the farm is a bit much, and it's coming in the house too. He went on to say that he thought I was brave living up there on my own, and that a long time before, many residents prior to us, an old lady died in the house at the top of the stairs, and had not been found for some time. This was the exact section of the floor where I discovered the smell. Now this old guy could well have been having a laugh and filling my head, but really sometimes I wonder if it were possible that some body fluids could have leaked down into that floorboards. Is it plausible? It was 9.30 in the evening and I heard a slight commotion from upstairs. So I got up and made my way up to see what was going on. Halfway up the winding stairs, I called out, what are you doing boys? The others are asleep. Stop it now. My second eldest son, who was about 10 at the time, came and leant over the top banister and yelled out for me to come and see his older brother. I entered the bedroom with my th three sons shared. My eldest was laying on his bed. I asked him, what's happened? What's going on? He said, nothing, it's the door. It won't close. Ah, is that all I wondered over and closed the door with ease. There you go, now go to sleep. Love you, good night. I was about to leave when his younger brother said, no, mum, the door flung him so hard he landed on his back on the bed. Now he won't touch the door. Is this true? I asked. Yes. He went on to tell me the door would not close, so he shoved and swore at it. He went on to say the door flung open, catapulting him right onto his bed. So there he stayed, and someone else could close the door and turn off the lights from now on. My daughter, who was about eight at the time, described an incident to me about what had happened to her while she was in the upstairs bathroom. She described how she watched an empty bath while listening to water noises that sounded like someone getting out of a filled bathtub. She said she then heard noises like someone's skin squeaking against the tub as they scrambled out. My oldest daughter, who was a teenager at the time, always told me even to this day she was afraid of this bathroom and would rather walk all the way down to the bottom bathroom rather than use the top one closest to the bedrooms. As I wrote this, I spoke to my girl who was now 20 years of age to get an accurate description of the incident. And she's just told me that she remembers it clearly to this day. 
She says she's a skeptic, but knows what she heard. I can find no other explanation for the noise. I could say it was the overactive imagination of an eight-year-old girl, but I don't think that was the case. My mind wanders in different directions, one of which is, could this have been whoever scrambling out of the bath and not quite making it for help and only making it to the top of the landing where they lay until they were found? I drifted off to sleep on the sofa while watching the TV. It was raining heavily outside and was therapeutic as it hit the windows. I had a nightmare and awoke suddenly, covered in perspiration, my t-shirt soaked right through. I heard a noise at the window, so with my heart still beating wildly in my chest, I got up to check. Nothing there. Must have been a deer. I closed the curtains and went back to the sofa, but as I sat down, ow, I pulled forward the neck of my shirt and saw something that truly terrified me. In a hurry, pulled off my shirt and was horrified, and I swear to you this is true. I was covered in long scratches. They went in all directions. But only from my breasts to the top of my navel. I sat there, mind racing, and came to the conclusion I must have done this to myself while having the nightmare. I grabbed my coat and wrapped myself in it. Still shaking, I tried to concentrate on the TV show, which was complete rubbish. My mind drifting to that terrifying dream. Stop thinking about it, I told myself. I was afraid, but more than that, it felt real. This didn't feel right, and the room had a heavy, dense, suffocating atmosphere to it. I eventually settled down, continued to watch TV, and remained awake for the next few hours, until the light came through the cracks in the heavy, lined curtains. I made my way to have a shower before making the breakfast, and I jest you not, I counted the scratches and there were 13 full-length marks. I continued to dismiss this, and every time my mind would wander, I would occupy it. But I couldn't get that nightmare which was of a satanic ritual out of my head. And it's also had 13 performance steps to it. This has never happened since. Then again, I never want to sleep on that sofa again. Burnside was a long, dark, creepy, unkept cottage. It had a big garage at the side and a large shed at the back. Way back over 47 years ago, police used bicycles and foot to patrol the streets. And if your village had an officer, you're one of the lucky ones. In this particular village, the local police officer had a report of a theft. And so he decided he would patrol the early hours of the morning on foot to catch the culprit. At 2 a.m., he set off on foot in his long coat and truncheon, belted to his side. He crept around the village and then decided, well, Burnside has these large sheds. Maybe it was the owners, my parents, that were doing the stealing. After all, they have room to store these goods. He hid out over the road in the woods, near to the old church. He made himself comfortable so he could get a bird's eye view. An hour had passed and then he saw something. It was a flicker of light. He watched, thinking, got you now, and waited for his moment. Making his way to the front of the premises to get a better look and to apprehend the person or persons, he was dumbfounded in what he witnessed. An old lady dressed in white linen, holding a single candlestick with a lit candle past each of the five windows. When she got to the first window, which was a second lounge room, she turned and faced the police officer through the small crisscross panes of glass. His words, she looked right at me. The police officer didn't scare easy and stood his ground. Then from a closed door came a young female dressed in a white night dress. Her golden hair flowing over her shoulders as she ran up the path. The police officer called out, hey, stop, wait. He ran to catch her, but the young woman glided around the corner of the house and disappeared. The officer looked around the property and the surrounding burn and could see no trace nor hear anything, and the cottage remained in darkness. He decided these people were guilty and knocked loudly at the front out of anger. 
The family all woke with the commotion and the youngest girl who was only four at the time, me, listened to the ramblings of this policeman. He said, I will sit every night till I catch you. He left and the next day enlisted help from two other men, setting them up in different areas. All three men saw the same thing at the exact same time. The following day, the trusted police officer came back and told my parents what they had seen. The old crippled man of the house, my uncle, told the officer the story. You see, many years before the house was two separate cottages, and in one end lived an old woman and her beautiful daughter. The old crippled man pointed out through one of the windows to a hill. See that hill there? An old road roller was parked and it was not braked properly, or the brake let go. It came thundering down into the side of the house, killing the girl instantly, and the old lady died from heart failure. He pointed to an old dark side unit, and on it sat a single candle bra. Castletown is a Scottish village, and a long time ago, witches used to gather in the old mill buildings to worship their master. On a late winter's night, a coven of 13 gathers around an old stone, after where they meet and greet one another, but this was not to last long. An old fisherman and a busybody wife decide this place was no place for such creepy goings on, and they call the police. The 13 split ways and re-meet the following week at a different location, with the same area in Castletown. The 13 were annoyed and upset at the locals, but continued their rituals, laughing and dancing around the small fire in the alternative location. Weeks passed and all was quiet in the village. All the gossip of the 13 passed and the locals found new things to talk about. An old man from the village was out on a moonlit night because he and his wife had had a disagreement, so we took a walk. He walked around the old harbour, then headed up past where the old dump used to be. He was being careful because he knew there was a quarry and it contained a deep hold of water. He could hear for miles on the calm night, and he did hear things. He heard a cry of a boy, help, help, help. The old man headed toward the body of water, calling out as he went. The man heard splashing, gurgling, more splashing. Horrified, he ran across the quarries, broken stones, and got to the edge of the water. Nothing. The moon shone upon the water. It was as still as the night. Afraid and shaken, the old man heads for home and calls the police to report what he heard. A search was conducted, but nothing found. Once a year on the very same night the 13 had met, if you're in that area, you can still hear the boy drown. The quarry is no longer there and the dump is long gone too. Trees are planted there now and still people report he is splashing along with a boy's screams of help. Locals who remember the story blame the 13 for this caused haunting. This is a strange story about an encounter with possibly a creature or spirit from when I was about five years old. At that time, my older sister and I slept in bunk beds and every now and then we would swap beds. So on this night, I was in the top bunk while my sister was on the bottom bunk. It was the middle of the night and something woke me up. Half asleep, I peered over the side of my bed at first, there was nothing, but then I heard some rustling coming from the closet across from me. This sound had also woken up my sister, and therefore we both witnessed what happened next. A small black bird shot from the closet and darted under the beds. Freaked out, I jerked back into bed, and in a quiet whisper, I asked my sister if she just saw what I did. She confirmed that she had seen the bird too. It was so strange that as any kid would, we agreed to call out for our mom. After a short time, my mom came into our room asking what was wrong. 
When we explained what had just occurred, she bent down and searched under the bunk beds. After looking everywhere, my mum stood up with a confused look and told us that there was nothing there. Somehow, the bird had just vanished. My sister and I were shocked. It had to be there. Both of us saw it. There was nowhere for it to go. The windows were closed and there were no holes under there for it to escape. My mum told us it must have been a dream and to go back to bed. We did as we were told and I forgot about it for years until I was talking with my mum and sister and they told me that they both remember that night and the vanishing black bird. It had been an incredibly hot and dry summer that year. And finally, the sky had opened up and it had started to rain. Excited, my whole family ran outside to cool down and have some fun. We were relieved to feel the cool change come through. But after about 10 minutes, the advancing lightning storm was above us. After a huge thunderclap, we all ran squealing and laughing inside the house to dry off. All except mum. While standing on our veranda watching the steam emanate from the hot concrete, she felt the hairs on the back of her neck rise, as if she was being watched. Following this feeling, her gaze shifted to my parked car in the front yard. Just after a deafening thunderclap, she shockingly saw the spirit of our family dog named Gypsy, who had just recently passed away and was buried in the front yard. She was standing in the front seat of my car with her paws on the headrest. Gypsy turned to her with a doggy smile. Mum felt like she was letting her know that she was fine and that she missed us. As soon as she thought to herself, what the hell? She disappeared like a mist. My mum walked into the house with a shocked look on her face. And when she told us what happened, I was so surprised, but happy to know she was okay. We'd had her since I was five years old and I missed her a lot. She was always there and it was strange for her to be gone. She died in 2012 and even years later, I still think of her. Hello all. My story takes place back about half a decade or so. I was serving as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They all sometimes call us Mormons, which is chill with me, I don't really care. Anywho, I spent two years of my life in the great state of Alaska, meeting people from all walks of life, performing acts of service, whether that be chopping wood or working at a soup kitchen, and of course, knocking doors trying to talk to people about Jesus. I have plenty of weird and strange experiences on my mission, whether that be the time my companion, the guy I teach and serve with, not a gay thing, and I were in a stairwell in a sketchy neighborhood at night. We both heard the same raspy voice in our left ear say, no, with no one there. The time I lived on a church on an Indian reservation, where the locals told us to be in by nightfall, and we heard strange things at night. Or even when an old Japanese man told us he could handle the Book of Mormon. We gave to him back to us with a note stuck in the middle that says, I'm sorry, I can't keep meeting with you gentlemen. Something has come up, and be careful, the others are watching. We went back a week or so later to check up on him due to him being older and alone. We peeked through his front window to see his home was absolutely bare. No furniture, nothing on the inside, and the man was a pack rat, and his house was a mess. So maybe he was kidnapped by a crazy secret society, I don't know. The full story I'm gonna share with you takes place in January of 2016. I lived in Fairbanks, Alaska, about 200 miles or so south from the Arctic Circle. Life was rough at the time the sun came up, only for a couple hours every day. And when it did, it only stayed on the horizon, with it being dark by around 3.30 or 4 every day. 
and to add sub-zero temperatures and people not exactly being the kindest given the circumstances, being a missionary was hard. With lots of slammed doors and nights eating cup of noodles by a heater. In the area of Fairbanks, there were about 10 or 12 missionaries serving different areas of the city. And like any organization, there has to be leaders to pass down information. We called these missionaries zone leaders. They gave us trainings, relayed information from our mission leaders, and just did the best to keep order amongst 20 or so 18 to 20 year olds. One of the duties that these leaders performed was go on exchanges with different sets of missionaries, where you would swap the person you would go out and teach with for the day, earn some pointers, be away from a companion you hate, several awesome things, I guess. At the time, our zone leaders were a very dysfunctional pair. In order to protect their privacy, I guess I'll call them Elder A and Elder B. Male missionaries are addressed as elders. Elder A was a jolly round farm boy, nice as can be, and not a lot going on upstairs, but nothing wrong with that. Elder B was on the service, a nice easygoing athletic guy, but deep turned out the man was a certified sociopath. The man was a cop now, so go figure. There was a lot of problems between the two of them. They clashed and fought all the time, and as you know, Contention can breed bad things. On to the events in question. I had gone on exchanges with Elder A and Elder B. I went with Jolly Elder A while the young Patrick Bateman Elder B went with my companion. I was going to be staying with Elder A in his area of town. They lived in what used to be a barn in the middle of the woods and had been crudely converted into a duplex with the elders living in the upstairs apartments. Let me tell you, this place sucked. The heating would go out in the middle of winter in Alaska, which is awesome. So they had to cover the windows with saran wrap and leave the oven open to heat the place. Not to mention the neighbors below smoked so much weed that if you went to the upstairs apartments for even an hour, your coat would stink of pot for days. So that's where my quarters would be on this sub-zero Arctic night. The day with Elder A was pretty normal, visiting people, teaching, shoveling an old woman's driveway. We then returned to the apartment in the evening. Everything went well until we had to go to bed. When you're on a mission, you have to be within sight and sound of your companion. Except, of course, you know, bathroom breaks and showers. So we had to share a room. As I was getting in bed, I noticed that Elder A had deadlocked the bedroom door as well as put a chain lock on it, which I thought was strange due to us locking the front door of the apartment as well. When I asked him why he locked the door, he said something like, oh, you know, I didn't say anything else. The dude was a strange bird, so I thought nothing of it and went to bed. I was rudely awoken several hours later to Elder A loudly moaning in the sleep. Like loud, dude, it was bad. I was quickly distracted by the moans when I noticed that the power was out, the heat was out, and I could see my breath in front of me. The only light in the room was the aurora borealis glowing outside. I suddenly felt a sick, dark feeling, like I was afraid, but I wasn't quite sure why. I suddenly realized that I could hear someone walking around in the kitchen. This wasn't normal, as we were the only ones in the apartment. I thought about getting up and checking it out, but I had this feeling that I needed to stay put in bed. I could hear who or whatever it was, moving plates and silverware around, and eventually walking around, not sounding like it was doing anything specific, just making noise. It sounded like it was just moving plates from one part of the counter to another. Eventually, it started just walking around in circles. I could hear the footsteps coming closer to the door and then moving away from it. It would do this around three times, walking close to the door and then walking away from it. The whole ordeal lasted around 10 minutes. My heart was beating out of my chest. I didn't know what to do, but being the religious person I was, I said a prayer to myself, asking whatever it was to go away. 
and right when the roster was finished, it stopped. I'm not sure what caused it, but whatever was moving around causing a ruckus didn't want to stick around anymore. I eventually was able to calm down. The power and heat turned on again, and I fell asleep the next morning. I had decided that it must have been a dream, and that in my state of in between awake and sleep, my mind was playing tricks on me. I had been exhausted and stressed out, so my restless mind must have been acting up. So I decided not to share it with anyone. That is, until two to three weeks later, I was hanging out with another set of missionaries who happened to live right by we were, up late swapping scary stories. I didn't have any good ones to tell, so I decided to tell my story at the zone leader's apartment. As I was telling my story, one of my buddies began to get very pale and quiet. When I finished, he explained that a week or so before I was in the apartment, he had been on exchange with Elder A as well. That night, they had decided to sleep with the door open. My buddy was awoken in the middle of the night, seeing an outline of a man in the doorway, or a shadow man, he, he wasn't sure. When my buddy asked the shadow man what he was doing there, the figure asked, I'm looking for Elder B, the sociopathic one, except he used his full name. My buddy said he wasn't sure there, as Elder B was with my buddy's companion. The figure vanished, and from there on out, Elder A and Elder B double locked the bedroom door every night. You're probably wondering as I was, why Elder B? Well, the man was always doing sketchy stuff. One time my companion and I had come home one evening to our apartment. Something felt off when we walked in. We walked into the living room to see that on our coffee table, there was a pentagram made of salt with a doll I had received for Christmas as a gag gift. In the middle, its eyes darkened out in Sharpie. My companion and I were shocked. We broke the pentagram and blessed our apartment, and then everything felt right. Another weird thing about Elder B? A time-lapse video. A video surfaced of him and a group of people, we didn't know who, wearing cloaks in a room, only lit by candles. We didn't recognize walking in a trance-like circle around the room. Elder B had gone back home to Arizona when it had surfaced, so no one could question him about it. To add a little fun note to this story, when I had finished my mission, I was telling the story to my father's extended family at our cabin, when I got to the part where the power had gone out. The power went out in our cabin, and my little brother got a bloody nose. Probably nothing but it certainly added to the atmosphere of my retelling of the events. Now, before this event, I certainly believed that there has to be something going on when it comes to the paranormal. And the stories we hear people tell, 99% of them are probably bullshit. Whether mine's in the 99 or one, it's up to you. Another takeaway was that if these dark spirits are really, and if they do indeed are malevolent, and want to cause harm per the rules of the universe, there has to be opposites in all things. And if there is this so-called dark and evil force, there has to be an opposite, a force of light and good. And that gives me a strange feeling of comfort for some reason. This happened a few years back and I still don't know what to think of it. I live in Northern Wyoming, and my family considered on going to the cabin up in the mountains. I proceeded to persuade my parents on letting me bring a friend with us. They agreed. Thank goodness too. We picked up my friend. His name is going to be Jason for privacy reasons. When Jason hopped in the pickup truck, we were babbling on what we'd do once we got up there. As we got there around noon, my mom made lunch and kicked us out of the rest of the afternoon. We found sticks and pretending as if we were in some call of duty. As the day went on, I showed him the treehouse. 
As we were sitting up there talking about school and the different things that were going on, Jason looked outward and his body froze. I looked at him. Hey man, you okay? I looked out where he was looking at. Off in the distance, I saw some sort of thing. Some creature poking its head out, looking straight at us. My heart started racing. The treehouse was just a platform on three trees. It had one way up and one way down. I looked at Jason and shook him to get him out of his haze. He looks at me and starts to say something about the creature. But he turns and sees that it's getting closer. The creature peered out. It was tall, about eight or nine feet off the ground. It was standing on. I tried to ask, what do we do? My guess, he panicked and went to the opening of the treehouse and jumped. Then proceeded to run to the clearing in front of the cabin. My eyes started to tear up. I was alone with that creature. As I turned, it was halfway between me and where we had first seen it. I scooted my butt towards the edge, still looking at the creature. It seemed to get closer when we were not looking at it. I flipped my body around to get a better hold of the ladder. I looked towards its direction and went for it. Once I got to the ground, I sprinted with all my might. Trying to see where Jason went, I saw him. His eyes got big and he started to scream, It's right behind you, run! At that point of time, I was pretty hefty. I guess when you're scared to death, it doesn't matter. I got to Jason. We turn around and see the creature that was peering at us from the tree line. We look up to the sun was going down. So we went back inside for the night. We tried to tell my parents what we saw, but of course, they didn't believe us. What do you guys think it was? My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old? Nobody knows exactly. It may have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the door that marks its age. So far, so good. There are two stories that I want to tell you. The first one happened when we just started dating. My boyfriend has searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day, I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he found the key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said he didn't find it. Later, we asked his parents and sister if they placed it there, but they all denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened yesterday. Some details to explain the setting. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably loud if you open it, so everyone knows that someone's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer at the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Squee? Then another door-like sound. Someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, hello? No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused, asking if we were mocking us. He affirmed that he wasn't inside before to open the squeaky door. As we wondered, they both told me that these kind of things have happened often before. Doors open, things move, and sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. They call their ghost Herbert after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. And I guess it's a friendly soul.
I've always been a strong paranormal believer and have various other paranormal experiences. For example, visits from my dead father as a toddler, a recurring dream of how the son of my current residence passed away until I learned that's how he passed and never had that dream again. Cutting to the chase, when I was in eighth grade, so a few years ago now, a new being became a visitor in my home. My room is L-shaped. Suddenly, I started seeing a figure walk from the further part of the L to about the middle, which was right at the edge of my desk and before the foot of my bed. The layout of my room is important to this story, I promise. Now, this became a nightly thing for at least three months. It would appear by my closet door and walk to the edge of my desk and stop. Every night at around midnight to 1am. To describe the figure, it was all black. A solid form. You couldn't see through it. It was large. It walked on all fours. But if I had to guess, it would be at least six foot tall on hind legs. It had very distinct limbs and features while maintaining a blur of sorts. Its elbows and knees are inverted. Decently skinny oval head, shape but no face. Its pace was fairly normal and I never really saw it appear or disappear. Simply there and gone. Now, at first, it terrified me, of course. But after a few weeks, I adjusted and it became normal. The thing is, like I said, it came the same time every single night for months after I had gotten into bed. Never mattered if the light was on or off. I couldn't fall asleep before it came, but after it left, I could. My friends assumed sleep paralysis, or some even thought I was schizophrenic. I never really tried to move, honestly, and after a while, I wasn't scared either. Now, I don't believe it was sleep paralysis because at times, I did move when it was present, but that comes later. It came and did its path in my bedroom. Eventually, I became too scared to sleep in my room, so my parents let me sleep on the couch in their room for a night or two. The way my house is, I could still see my doorway down the hall. Again, I couldn't sleep and it was late. I'd never seen it go further than the corner of my desk. Now it peeked out from my doorway into the hall, to about its shoulders. Again, it stopped there. One of the last times I saw it, it actually showed itself at my middle school. I left class to grab something. The halls had three sets of staircases and as I walked, it came out one of the stairwells ahead of me. One night I did some research and recited something I found, pretty much saying I wished to find a place it liked but it couldn't stay at home. After that, it was over. I've retold this story many times and though my brain envisions it and I get chills, it hasn't returned and I hope to God that it doesn't. Here's the part I don't quite understand though. It was there for months, but never once did it actually come closer to me than the foot of my bed. It always appeared as though it was looking for something almost similar to a dog sniffing the air, looking around, yet it never looked at me. No matter where I saw it, it was near me, but it was kind of like it wanted nothing to do with me personally. Again, never once had it interacted, tried to intimidate, look at, or anything to me or my family. I think that's why I got so comfortable with it. A friend suggested maybe it was protecting me from something. I'd really love to hear ideas on what the figure may have been or what its objective could have been. I was probably 12 or 13 at the time and cycled the eight kilometers to school every single morning. Most days, I had a group of my Catholic school buddies riding along, but I preferred the solitary moments pedaling through those quiet roads the most, and it still stands as my best memories of school times. There was a tiny underpass, large enough for one rickshaw at the time, that brought me to school quicker across the army 
cantonment area in Kirky Pun. Often, as I zipped through the underpass, an aged lady I would spot sitting in the corner just after. A single bag of belongings by her side, brewing some tea in a little utensil set atop a little wood fire. It was the fourth time coming across the lady, watching her little bag of food that I finally got the courage and heart to stop and talk to her. Namaste, Aji, I said, Aji being grandmother in the Marathi language. Do you live here, Aji? I see you sitting here every day as I pass. She looked up with myopic eyes and said, I live all around this place, and this is where I sit to brew my tea and eat some food. This is my home now, and has been my home ever since I left home. I didn't ask her why she left and knelt next to her, watching the frail and delicate lady in her pink sari, struggling to open her packet of dal and rice. Without thinking, I took out my lunch from the pack on my cycle, asked her for a plate if she had one, and placed more than half of my tiffin onto it. She looked at the food in disbelief and asked what I would eat throughout the day. And I told her that I had friends who were happy to share their food if need be. Gave her the six one rupee coins I had and bade goodbye as I was getting late for school. And every single day after that, I would look for her at her usual spot and for sure, there she was. Preparing her tea and after a quick chat and my tiffin on her plate, I would speed off to school before the entry gate shut for assembly. My pocket's money of coins I would hand over without fail, never once thinking I would need it to buy some candy or snacks from the school canteen. They would often miss bringing on tamarind candy packets on some days. Some days when I had more time, I would chat with her and tell her some stories from school and my playtime, and she in return would hum a song or two as she ate the food. Soon it was school break, and I bade her goodbye for a month or two and gave her around 200 rupees I had received during one of the festivals from my aunt. I hoped it would suffice for some food and her stock of tea in the weeks I couldn't meet her. She assured me of having shelter and a source of food available and though uneasy, I bid her a see you soon. I often thought of her in holidays, but playing with friends soon distracted me. I did request a friend to cycle with me to the spot with some fruits and snacks, but she was nowhere to be seen. So soon school set in, and amidst the monsoon, I went through the usual routes, but again, she wasn't there, nor was seen for the next two weeks. I grew worried and increased my route on the way home, hoping to spot her sitting under a bus shelter or somewhere safer. I even asked about her to the cycle repair shop guy who filled air in the children's tires, often, and was just a kilometer ahead of Adji's spot. He hadn't spotted her all these days after. Finally, one sun-soaked morning, I found her at the same spot again, making her favorite tea. I stopped with a rush and shouted, Adji, where have you been all this time? I got food for you daily. She smiled with her broken teeth and bade me a warm hello. Don't worry, Beta. I've been around, but I'm going away soon. I need to go home. Home, I asked. Home to family? Home to family, yes, she smiled. I offered her my tiffin again, and she offered her plates once more. But something in me felt different. I felt a deep sense of loss as I looked at her. Maybe wondering if this was the last time I would see her. Once again, I got up and kept the tiffin back in the pack, looked at her and started cycling to school while waving her a goodbye. School went as usual, but her face kept popping up in my mind for some reason. Once it was time to leave, I stopped at the cycle shop to get my air filled and mentioned to the owner that I had finally met Adji after ages. Anna, met Adji today after so long. Thank goodness she's still around. I was worried she had moved to another place far away. Anna looked at me with wide set eyes. Our Adji, who always sits there, you say? Ah, and yes, who else Anna? I met her today and she was telling me she's finally going back home. 
I guess to her village. OP, I didn't want to tell you because you were so attached to her, but she died during the monsoon due to her age and the relentless cold weather we had since some time. I looked at him in shock and couldn't believe it. I told him I had given her food just this morning. It can't be. I got astride my cycle and rushed to the spot. There was no sign of the food I had given her, nor any telltale signs of a little wood fire being lit that very morning. I stood there frozen, and the next moment, with an onset of fear, speed cycled all the way back home. I was still a child back then, and the fact that her spirit had bade goodbye hit me a bit differently. I avoided that path for months, but soon started cycling on that route again, mod mollified. But some years later, when I thought back to that day, I realized what an honor it was to receive her last goodbye. And I still recall her smile and her humming songs whenever I passed by that spot. I started my job as a care assistant in a nursing home in 2019. The home used to be an old orphanage, which explained the noises of children laughing and crying, and also the noises of balls bouncing and little footsteps. There were four floors in the nursing home, and each floor and the staff and most residents working on those floors would often see the lady in white or a woman in black. There are multiple stories staff share their own experiences with each other, but this was mine. One particular shift, I started my day with the usual routine, coffee, and made my way to start with the first room. As I was walking into the room, I had seen a woman dressed in a long, black, old-fashioned dress slowly come out of the room next door. I rubbed my eyes as my heart sank, and she was gone. I carried on my usual routine, and the lady I was seeing to at the time said, that woman has been in here again. I asked that woman she was talking about, knowing full well I had just seen her, and that I was shitting myself. She then went on to tell me that when she comes, it's either me or one of my neighbors that have to go. I was confused, scared, and carried on asking her as many questions about this woman as I could. The lovely lady didn't speak for the rest of my time in her room. So later that day, I had spoken about it with another member of staff who had been there longer. She said when the woman in black is seen by the residents, there's a death within a week or two. At first I was like, am I going to fucking die? I've seen her. She said no, she feeds off the vulnerable and the weak. This woman makes herself known she shows herself as and when she wants. A good few days went by, and I was in the lift going to the very top floor, which is where the children were most heard. The lady in white was mainly seen up here. I believe she protects the children still. As the lift stopped at the top floor, and the doors began to open, I heard what I could only describe as a woman whispering very angrily down my ear. It was fast, strong, and quick, the hairs on my neck stood still. I could hear my own heartbeat hitting my chest. I just knew it was her. I remember being in the dining area on the top floor. It was super quiet towards the end of our shift as most of the residents were independent on that particular unit. So the doors would be closed and you had some time to make a coffee and do paperwork without anyone really needing help or assistance. I'm waiting for the kettle to boil, and I heard what I can only describe as furniture being moved around by a rugby team, but it was coming from the attic. No one had access to the attic, only maintenance, but most night staff would hear running up and down, balls bouncing, children whispering and playing. I unplugged the kettle and ran towards the window of the dining room, which was facing the front of the building. I could see an ambulance was turning into the entrance of the building. All the noise had now stopped. I wondered who the ambulance could have been for, as no one that I knew of was poorly at the time. It's time to clock out of my shift 
and I ask our senior member of staff who needed the ambulance. The lovely lady who I had seen a few days before when I saw the woman in black had passed away unexpectedly. I left work thinking about what had happened and thought over and over in my head that my lovely old lady knew it would be her or one of her neighbours as she called the other residents. My next shift was on the top floor again. I began doing a walk around check, which is routine. As I checked up on one of our gentlemen who was fairly new to the building and still settling in, he shouted me into his room and told me if I could ask the lady in the white gown to stop standing outside of his bedroom with her children. Again, my heart dropped and my face surely said it all. I asked him what time she had been stood outside his bedroom. He said he fell asleep at around 10 p.m. in his armchair and woke feeling cold and uncomfortable. He said he glanced at the door to see a lady in a white gown with some small children around her just staring into the bedroom for a couple of minutes until they turned to the right side of the corridor. The right side of the corridor on that unit leads to the maintenance door that goes up to the attic. I didn't ask what time this was and he told me it was 2.45 a.m. Anyways, so after having a mental breakdown and walking away from this bedroom, I carried on with all routine checks and there was me and another staff member on the units that day. After lunch, I was stood outside the dining room talking to the girl I was working with and she said, can you hear that? I said, what? She said, that woman crying. We stopped speaking and I listened very carefully and I could hear a woman crying. A woman crying as if she was heartbroken, like sobbing, then within a split second silence. I began to tell my work friend what had been going on and what the gentleman had also told me this morning. She was freaked out to say the least. After a while, she took her break and I was cracking down on some paperwork in the office. Had the radio on, but only quietly. I noticed my battery life was draining so much as I was writing, the radio began to switch stations rapidly and the volume was going up and down, down up and down. The same cry was coming through the radio that we had heard just before. I literally dropped my pen left my phone and dashed from the office and just as I had got out of there, the gentleman in 417 shouted to me, I told you to tell her. So skip to a couple months down the line, the gentleman in 417, his health started to decline. So unfortunately he wasn't very mobile and wasn't very independent. So he was soon to leave the unit to go down onto the bottom unit, which is the basements converted. He often mentioned the lady in white and her children sometimes. He told me that she's been again. And what I had noticed is he would say this sort of stuff the night before or on the night of someone sadly passing in the building. Which I obviously wouldn't find out until the day before when I'd come on shift. So did the lady in white gather the children together as she knew the woman in black would be around for someone passing? I've had two years of sh thinking this shit through in trying to make sense of it all. 417 ended up moving down to the very bottom units, eventually, and when staff clock out and leave the back way, they pass his room. I was leaving work and I decided to go back way this particular night. As I clocked off at eight, and I shouted good night and waved to him. He shouted my name, so I said, yes, is there anything I can do for you? He said, how come you didn't tell me there's a woman in black down here? My heart. After knowing another resident had seen the woman in black, my heart sank even more. A constant anxiety I had returning to the building every next shift I had. Being on each unit, I learned that every unit had its own different entities shadow people walking along the wall, dark figures changing their appearances, the smell, the change in energy, the huge dark mists in residents' room that would stay in one spot. Not everyone saw as much as me, apart from the man under the bed. Me and another girl were doubling up together, not so long ago, 
and starting at one end of the corridor, the lady who we were seeing to was very quiet and barely spoke. We got to her room and noticed she was hissing, spitting and shouting, get out of here, get from out behind the curtains. Yes, the curtains were still closed as it was around 8 a.m. It didn't look as if anything was behind them, but we reassured her as such as possible by this point. She was very distressed. The girl I was working with was concerned. She was hallucinating until the lady told us he was under the bed. We had pulled the bed out as one of us works on each side of the bed as the lady is cared for in bed. After trying to take her mind off things by changing conversation and talking about things she once enjoyed, this quiet little old lady was having none of it. She kept reminding us that he's under the bed. So after almost finishing up in her room, we pushed the bed back and I began to collect the clothes for laundry. Within seconds of me picking the clothes up and being ready to go onto the next room, the other girl who I was working with was pushed backwards onto the floor in full force and was kicking thin air. I panicked and asked her what had happened and she screamed, something is actually under the fucking bed. She stood up with tears running down her face with fear and repeated herself. Once I managed to calm her down and asked her what had happened and if she had seen anything, she told me she felt two large hands push into her chest with so much force, and when she hit the floor, she could feel someone standing over her. She said she couldn't see anything, but she knew something was there. After having a lot of scary encounters and experiences within the home, I decided to ask the maintenance man, Len, who had been working at the home for some time. I told him what I had seen and what's happened since me working there. I asked him firstly what he thought about the woman in black. He began to laugh, he said, so I take it you've seen her too. He went on to tell me that the lady in white indeed does protect the children up on the top unit. He told me the children love to play until it's time to hide. He said the little girl, Mary, talks to him all the time and even follows him and even watches him do his jobs around the home. He said no one really talks to him while he's working, but Mary and the other children definitely keep him company. I asked him if the sounds of balls bouncing would be from the children playing and he said, of course, I'm the one who brought them the ball. I didn't really know what to think or say. I was shocked, but also it was so sweet at the same time. Len told me the woman in black is indeed very evil and has workers within the home. She has taunted him many times. She knows how much I love the children, he stated. Although they aren't here in the physical world, I have no wife and children. Me and the spirits both need friends. Len began to tell me his experiences with the lady in white and his experience with the woman in black and the other dark entities. I was so interested and wanted to hear everything. I asked Len if he could start from the beginning. So he did. The first dark encounter, as Len called it, he had been left some notes from the staff over the weekend about lights flickering and switching on and off. The same problem was happening on every other unit, barring the top floor. Len began looking into this straight away and started on the middle floor. He started in room 313 and wanted to make his way through the home onto the other units. Len said he walked into 313 and saw all the lights were on. He flipped the switches. Everything was fine. No tripping, no flickering. He said he waited around a couple of minutes to see if he could see any other issues. Absolutely nothing. Len turned his back and began to head for the door. He said he automatically could feel as if he was being watched. But not being watched from behind, but as if someone was stood at the doorway blocking his way. Len stood still. He remembers the horrific smell that had come over the room within seconds. It smelt like I was in the middle of an abandoned slaughterhouse. Len stood still and asked if there was anything there with him. He expressed how he now felt there were hundreds of eyes on him and that he began to feel physically sick. Len ran out of 313 and never told anyone about it until he met me. 
if there's one room I'm scared of, it's 3.13. I asked Len about his first time seeing the lady in white. Len began to smile and said, after I ran from room 313, he said she comforted him at the perfect time. He told me after a while, once he began to feel better, he sat on the fire exit stairs outside of the top unit door and he saw a woman in a lovely white gown coming up the stairs. He said he stood up for her to pass and before he knew it, she was stood in front of him and he was just stood in front of her. Her smile brightened my mood suddenly. I felt better. Len moved out of the way to let the lady pass and he noticed she was rather floating than walking and she disappeared through the door. And all of a sudden, I knew she wasn't here in the physical world, but I was no longer afraid. As he looked through the glass of the door, the lady in white passed through. He said there were like five little children beside her. And that's how he met little Mary. Len and I spoke many times about his experiences. The one he enjoyed speaking of most was how he met Mary. After first seeing the lady in white and the children Len was no longer afraid of, the home in the darkness that lies within it, he quoted, in the darkest of places, the light will always find you. Len had noticed his tools would go missing while he was working on jobs and then would return. He began slowly to talk to the spirits of the children, as he knew it would be them. He said he had a warm feeling and could feel them when he couldn't see them. Until he first saw Mary, he said he was sat in his office on the bottom unit. It was a normal day. Len said the usual routine, my office door is always open while I'm in there. From the corner of my eye, I could see a little person stood in the doorway. I turned my head and there was Mary in her blue dress. She smiled at me and waved. I smiled back and asked her what she was doing down here. She said she was running and hiding from the other children. I told her my name and she told me hers. I then said to Mary that she can hide in the office, but only when the door is open. The visits from Mary became more frequent, he said. I began to know her better and started to bring in old books from home into my office. I noticed she would take pencils from my office, so I knew I had to think of something better than books. That's when I bought the ball, he said whilst laughing. I know everyone thinks I'm a crazy old man in here, but I don't care. I can see a whole different world to many others. A world much more beautiful. I found out Len moved his books and toys he had brought for the children into the attic, as it's empty and very big. And that's where they are most of the time. Len didn't want anyone moving or touching. What's for the children? When I was a young teen, maybe 13, I was home alone that evening. My brother was at his friend's house for the night and my dad was fishing. It was dark and I was sitting on the couch watching TV. All was quiet, doors were locked. Out of nowhere, the TV went black. Then it turned into a snowy screen with no sound. It's wicked quiet and the hair on my neck started to stand. Then I heard something heavy being drug on the floor directly above me. I'm now terrified, thinking someone snuck in the house and I'm all alone. I sit perfectly still in order to listen for footsteps. Nothing. So I go into the kitchen and grab a knife, cause you never know. I open the door upstairs and it's pitch black. I yelled and warned whomever I had a weapon and would use it. Nothing. Silence. So I creep up the stairs not knowing what to expect, hoping no one is there. And all of this is not real. I reach the landing and nothing is there. Only one bedroom up there and I was ready to kick the door open. One, two, three. Not a soul in the room. As my eyes dart from side to side, making sure no one is there, I notice something isn't right. Once you walk through the door, there is a long eight foot maybe dresser packed with clothes. Somehow, this heavy dresser's left side 
was pulled about one and a half foot away from the wall. No explanation how, even scratch marks on the wood floor from where it was pulled. It's never happened again, but this is only one story. This story took place about six years ago. We just moved into a new home a few doors down from my mother-in-law's. She had been diagnosed with cancer, so we moved closer to be able to help her. My husband and I had one child at this time. He was around two or three years old. My son had always shared a room with us till we moved there. His room was on the far side of the house. We had a baby monitor in his room, just in case. About two weeks after we moved in, my husband left for work about 8 or 9 p.m. as he worked thirds then. Our son was asleep and I stayed up watching TV for a little while. All seemed well as I lay on my bed and listening to the TV, hoping for some sleep. As I start to drift off, I hear quick footsteps like our son was running to our bedroom door. I sit up, expecting my son to open the door. I wait and wait, but the door never opens. I go and open the door, expecting him to be standing there, but he wasn't. I walk down the hallway and don't see him anywhere. I go to the kitchen to get a drink of water before I try to go to sleep again. Thinking this was my sleepy head playing tricks as the house was so silent, I knew my son wasn't awake. I take my drink of water and something catches my eye. In the darkness in the opposite hallway across from me, I see a little silhouette. I feel a rush and my legs get weak. I call my son's name and ask if he's okay. He stands there perfectly still and silent. As I round the counter to go to him, he says, Mommy, the little girl won't stop playing and keeps waking me up. My heart skips a beat and I grab him up and take him to my room. Needless to say, he slept with mommy for a few nights after that. Despite not being a believer, I've always felt my house had some sort of entity inside it. It's been here since the Victorian era and originally was a shady warehouse owned by an even shadier businessman. My family is in no way related to this businessman. We are Zimbabweans, not sure if I have to clarify, but we are white. To cut to the meat, in 1809, seven people were found strung up in a basement that no longer exists. A seance was performed in that same basement to communicate with the spirits of the dead. The whorehouse businessman died in the room that I now live in. In 1811, the house was owned by a surgeon who was famously pretty bad. My town has a bar named after him. The house was abandoned until 1847, when the now garden was used to dispose of disease victims. And on top of all that, six babies have died in here from various causes, not excluding dog attack and surgery mishap. Onto the experience of living here, most notably, I once stepped out of my room into the corridor to see a large flaming cross in front of the mirror. It was there for about half of a second. Any visitors who come here feel really cold at night and feel scratching on their backs. Women with pregnancy-related trauma feel incredibly uncomfortable and nauseous walking through the kitchen. Friends of mine who stayed over are no longer friends of mine. Jokes but there's at least two who won't enter my room. Often people see floating limbs poking out from behind doors or entrances. People have hellish nightmares, constant tapping and scratching on the walls, doors slamming shut. I recall being stared at by an entity from the corner of my room. My brother has woken up with long, deep scratches on his face and hands. My father refuses to talk about what he saw in one of our lofts. My mother is terrorized by voices whenever she's home alone. Lights flicker when you approach them. Once you pass them, you feel helpless and incredibly cold. Non-sleepwalkers sleepwalk. 
Posters and signs are ripped off the walls. I've had my hand grabbed with immense pressure when I reached into a cupboard for a drink. Women yell, footsteps come up the stairs, dishes have faces on them, clothes get ruined, hats get stolen and never returned. People occasionally get flung around. Sometimes food spoils in minutes. It's kind of shitty. We moved away from that house two years ago. So it's kind of clickbaity though. When I was around 19, a good friend of mine's dad had died suddenly. Needless to say, she was devastated. It was a really hard time for her. Her boyfriend and his family had a barbecue and I was good friends with him also, so I went. His family and my parents were also good friends and a lot of people I know are their friends and family. So I just started smoking and I get there late, all high, stupid, minding my own business, in the corner with my friend Nick. In comes a lady named Mary Carmen. She's an older Mexican lady around her 40s or 50s at the time. I didn't know this at the time, but I guess she's claimed to be able to seance the dead. Everyone is in the kitchen or in the backyard, which are only separated by the screen door, which I'm standing right next to. All of a sudden, I hear a loud thump and I just see Mary Carmen on the floor. So a couple of people go check on her and she starts to kind of seize. I'm tripping hard at this point and even harder when she started speaking in tongue. So this is going on for a couple seconds and me and Nick are just staring at each other like, what the fuck? All of a sudden she shouts, Lisa, my friend whose dad passed away. Lisa starts stepping towards her, but kind of slowly because I'm sure she was tripping too. So when she goes up to her, Mary Carmen hugs her tight and starts whispering in her ear. At first it seemed normal, aside from the obvious, but all of a sudden Lisa puts her hand in her mouth and starts crying. A couple more seconds of Mary Carmen whispering and Lisa just takes off running, crying. I don't remember much after, but eventually Mary Carmen got back up and I pretty much left right after. I've never been religious or a believer of ghosts and shit, and neither was my mom who was there. When I talked to my mom, she said, wow, that's fucked up. I can't believe an older woman would take an advantage of a younger girl in such a vulnerable state. So I kind of adopted that mindset. A few days later, or maybe the next day, I don't know, a bunch of us are together talking about what happened. And I pretty much repeated what my mom told me. The thing that creeps me out and what makes this so memorable to me is Lisa's boyfriend looks at me and says, I don't know, bro. I talked to her and I guess Mary Carmen told us something only her dad would know. To this day, I don't know what she said and I kind of want to ask, but never did just because of the subject being so sensitive. It just trips me out because as much as I don't believe, or I guess I don't want to believe, Mary Carmen and Lisa weren't that close and not people that would talk to each other a lot. So I don't know how she would get that kind of information. To this day, I still think about that shit being one of the weirdest experiences of my life. About a month ago, I went with eight of my friends to a cabin. That belongs to one of the friends that came along. This is placed right on the shore of a big rigger. We only spent two nights there. On the last night, we were all sitting on the dock. This is more like a platform because it's surrounded by a fence and it's not used for boats, only for sitting around like we were. And we were having the usual night talks. It was about 4 a.m. Then, suddenly, I heard a weird sound and I told them to stay quiet and listen. We shut up and all heard a melody that seemed like the kind of song you hear from a music box. The song lasted for less than 10 seconds and vanished into the silence of the night. We all started to freak out and question what the fuck did we just witness? We were alone at the cabin and there weren't any other houses nearby. We spent the rest of the night sitting together on the dock, talking about paranormal stuff and coming up with theories. What's weird about the song 
is that the sound seemed to be coming from everywhere and it also seemed to be very near. The next day when we woke up, the friend that has the cabin told us about a bit about the history of the house and about his grandparents that had built it. And apparently his grandpa gave his wife, my friend's grandma, a music box when they were young. But he wasn't sure if this was actually true. The whole place was quite creepy. A lot of weird dolls were in every room, but I brushed it off in the beginning because the cabin was old. If we didn't have it to leave that day and our train wasn't that early, we would have investigated more by going to the villages that were about one hour and a half away by foot and asking the locals about any similar stories. So I asked my friend to tell me more about the history of the cabin, and this is what I found out. In the region the cabin is placed about 50 years ago, some tunnels were built and some of the workers died in the process. My friend's grandparents, that were of course young at the time, decided to pay tribute to those who died by putting a cross on one of the mountains that were found there. With the help of a few other people, the cross was right in front of the deck we were sitting on, on the other side of the river. My friend unfortunately can't ask his grandparents more at the moment because they don't live in the same town as us and he doesn't want to tell them this over the phone. So I'm 17 and I've been living with ghosts my entire life so far. The earliest sighting of one of them I can ever remember I was at least seven or eight, and I woke up from a nightmare. I was so scared, but I went down the hallway to my mom's room, and she had this old mirror. And I got in there, I sat on her bed to go under the covers. Before I did, I got this weird feeling like dread and fear go through my body, and the feeling of someone looking at me. I turned towards the mirror, and there was a tall, dark figure standing there inside of it. He wore a hat, and all I could see for his features was a big smile, and he was tilted to look down at me. He was there the entire night I stayed under the covers. I knew he was still there, because I got the feeling he was looking at me. Since then, I gave him the name The Mirror Man. The second time he bothered me, his hand was coming out of the wall to reach for me, as well as his foot coming out. I was freaking out, and my mom noticed and she opened the front door. She yelled and cursed at him to get out, and for two years I wasn't bothered at all by him. Instead, there was a ghost girl that liked sitting on the stairs near my room, and we could usually hear her running around and laughing. I would hear scraping of somebody walking near my window at 3am every night, like they were dragging their feet across the road, or the dragging of something heavy outside my door. The knocking on my walls on the second floor near my window where nobody can reach without a ladder. Recently, I heard humming in my backyard at around 4 a.m. Loud enough for me to hear even past my headphones, aggressive coughing every once in a while like the person had tuberculosis. One night, I was laying in my bed and I heard some scraping noises at the end of my bed. I moved my laptop out of the way so I could see what I thought it was. My cat, because she sleeps in my room, but there was a pale white face looking back at me from the foot of my bed. I sat there, staring at like we had a staring contest for at least four minutes, and then it moved, so I grabbed a sock and threw it at it, and yelled at it to go away, so I can sleep. What did I get in return? It tugged at my hair for a little bit. This is going to be the last one for now, because all of them have been up and about recently. A lot more I was sitting in my room. When it was in the basement, my mom and little brother fought on the other side of my door in the living room and I was playing on the PS4 with my friends. And I was talking to them, but as I was speaking, I felt two hands come up to my neck and squeeze. I could feel every single finger squeezing my neck. I paused in confusion and felt my neck, but there was nothing there but I can still feel pressure on it for at least three seconds go by, and something pulled my hair. I was a little annoyed and got up, told it to leave me alone. May have provoked it a little, I was just tired and annoyed, so I wasn't thinking. But it stopped, 
is now retreated into my closet. I can still feel that burnt chicken nugget looking at me. A few hours ago, something happened very interesting. I was sitting in my room and I was on the PS4 with my friends. We were playing a game together and I got the feeling someone was watching me. So I looked at my door that is on my left from my TV, near my closet. The light is on outside the door in the hallway. My lights are off in my room and I can see shadows moving under my door from the light. But there were no feet or no noise. I was getting up to open the door to see if it was one of my siblings messing with me. I was just about to get to my door when my door was kicked open so hard it banged off the wall and made a dent with the doorknob. I stood there in shock and my friends were yelling out to me what was going on, what was that noise? I walked out my room slowly and looked around. Nobody was there. If someone was going to kick my door in, they would have to run really quick to get out of my view. But there was nothing, just the hallway, all doors closed and the light on, and then the humming began outside my window. I ran to my window, opened my curtains, and there was nothing there. But the only thing that was there was the feeling of eyes on me. I'm greatly annoyed, but I'm only used them jiggling the doorknobs, moving the door, but not kicking my door open. That one's new. Me and my two brothers would sometimes have dreams involving portals to other worlds. They weren't necessarily believable places, like a cartoon dinosaur world, for example. What was, ex what was unique about these dreams was that they were often shared dream experiences. One of my brothers, Brother A, would not dream about portals, but rather would wake up, or perhaps dream he woke up. He would be able to tell one of us if we had a dream with a portal to another world because we were missing from our bed. I'll skip the majority of the stories because they rely on the witness of my two brothers. For that same reason, I would be very skeptical about the dreams until I could get some kind of proof. I had one where I found one of my brothers, Brother B, and showed him a portal. We went in together and it was the set of the beginning of the universe in the Bible where light was created. Everything turned white for a while, and then I could see again my brother was gone. From there, I watched the universe get created. I'm not religious, but bear in mind that the portal world could sometimes be way less believable. When I woke up, Brother A said he couldn't find me and asked if I had a portal dream. Brother B recalled that I had shown him a portal, that everything turned white and that he got frustrated and left before the light had faded. I hadn't told either of them about my dream beforehand. A little context. Mid-July, my sister upsized into this apartment that's located in a pretty secluded spot. There are forests all around, open her windows and there are trees everywhere. I decided to pay her a visit for the first time since it was my birthday and the first night in. I believe I experienced something, but I'm not sure. She and I have had separate encounters, but I haven't told her mine. My sister is a little sensitive to all things paranormal. She doesn't see spirits on a daily basis, but she tends to feel energies at certain places. She also has a puppy, a little Westy, that she believes has seen whatever is in the apartment. At first, I told her she was being paranoid because it's a new place. But after last night, I'm not too sure, to be honest. The one major experience she's had, about two weeks ago, is that while sleeping, she woke up feeling intense fear, only to see a weird shadowy thing floating above her bed before fading away. She described its shape as what happens when you drop ink in water. And we both felt like it was just the mind playing tricks. We watch a lot of paranormal videos, but I don't think I've seen what my sister is describing. 
Oftentimes, it's a figure, mists or clouds or just orbs, right? Cut to my first night here. I wake up feeling weird. I'm sleeping on my tummy. Then I hear whooshing sounds moving from the left to the right of me. I'm fully awake at this point. The ceiling fan and air con are running, but I have a blanket up to my neck, maybe? I'm definitely not feeling cold. The air feels heavy, like it's a controlled blast of air. And every time it moves from the left to the right, when it passes my face, I feel it rest on my face for a bit and a soft bang near my ears follows. It happens approximately three times before I feel a weight on the back of my neck, then travels down to the bottom of my spine. I finally move over to lie on my back and whatever it was is completely gone. The weirdest thing is, I don't necessarily feel fear, but my heart rate is super high. I didn't tell her because I feel like it was sleep paralysis, which I've never experienced before. Or maybe my body getting accustomed to sleeping in a new environment. Last night, however, my sister asked me if I opened one of her drawers seconds after I left her room. I didn't open them. And when I left the room, I don't think they were open either. If anybody could tell me what they think I experienced or give more insight on this matter, I'd be very grateful. Nineteen ninety-eight. I'm four years old. My parents, my older brother and I, moved in our house. We live in a town that used to be an English community. Someone once told me that these English people belonged to a religion. I don't know which one. That clung, grasp or fill a lot on the earth, and that is why when many died, they did not leave this world. So in this town, there are many old houses and many ghost stories. There were always many noises, perhaps striking, but that we associate with the noises of a house. The upper floor was a concrete floor. I mean a floor, not finished. And one of the noises I heard was the footsteps of a barefoot person coming up the stairs and walking down the hall. Sometimes I would get up thinking that my parents were coming up to greet us. But since nobody showed up, I went to look for them and they were still sitting at the table watching TV. Not much more happened. Around 2008, I'm 14 years old. At this stage, this man who lives in my house begins to manifest much more. Sometimes I would see a shadow out of the corner of my eye. A couple of times, I saw it through the mirror of my room. But when I looked again, there was no one. A friend of my brother told me that she once saw a man sitting on the couch in my house. And when I asked her for his description, he was the same man that I had seen a couple of times. He was tall, brown hair, short beard, glasses, and skinny. On the afternoons that I would come home from school and stay alone in my house, I would listen to someone play the piano. A couple of times, I heard him humming songs too. I also used to have the feeling that he was present or where he was in the house. A feeling that I could not explain to someone who did not feel it because it was not a suggestion. It was like a kind of security. This is kind of weird. Sometimes I would close my eyes, but I would, could distinguish his shadow. Anyway, the presence that used to live in my house and did not bother me again began to disturb me. I felt that he was following me that he knew where I was noticing him and that he wanted to be noticed. He was more and more present. I was very scared because I was younger, so I told my family. 2010, I'm 16 years old. My mom meets this very spiritual woman, let's call her Anna, and tells her the story. Anna offers to come to my house to take him out. The fact that Anna was offering it for free made me trust that she didn't want to rip us off. We organized one day in the morning. Only Anna and one other person could be in my house. And since I was the one who let, felt the presence, I stayed with her. Anna told me that we were going to go through every room in my house in a clockwise direction. 
In each room, she did something called key of something I don't remember. Yale de in Spanish. She closed her eyes and made some signs with her hands. When she finished, we went to the next room, almost always in silence. Almost nothing happened, only that, one, in my brother's room, my ears are suddenly clogged, or plugged, I don't know the word. Two seconds later, Anna tells me, my ears are clogged. That means he knows I want to take him out and he's trying to lower my energy. Two, in my room, when Anna is doing this key thing, I suddenly feel like he left. And again, Anna tells me after two seconds, I think he left, but we're still going to finish with the rest of the rooms. When Anna left, my house was so different. It was like pulling a heavy backpack off your back. Since you were used, so used to having it, you didn't remember what it was like to feel liberated. It was as if the air weighed 20 kilometers less. That first night, that was the first night living in that house without noises, without footsteps and without many other noises that I no longer remember, but that I always thought were from the house. And something strange happened to me that night. I don't know if it was a dream. I think I really woke up and it happened, but it could have been a very lucid dream. I woke up in the middle of the night in my bed and I hear a noise coming from the living room. It was as if someone was shaking a door, trying to open it without success. At that moment, I associated it as a cage because it was a metallic noise, as if there were a prison gate. Eventually, I fell asleep, but I always remembered that moment because it was so weird. A couple years later, I run into a neighbor who lives a couple of blocks from my house. He's a guy with a lot of sensitivity. I hadn't told him anything about this experience, and he tells me that he had a dream where he talks to a sad man. My neighbor asks the sad man why he is sad, and the man replies that he was kicked out of his house. My neighbor asks the sad man what his name is, and the sad man answers, X name, the same name with which we referred to the presence in my house, an extremely rare name. This experience takes place in the home of my grandmother, which she has lived in for the past 40 or more years. Ever since my grandfather, a mechanic, had passed away in the house, it had always seemed less inviting going back, as the memory of seeing him on his final day is depressing. During this past January, my family and I had decided to spend a few weeks at my grandmother's house, who had lived around 600 kilometers away, about 350 miles. I remember the day very clearly. It was approaching seven in the evening and the sky was beginning to dull. My cousin, who was present in the experience, had invited me to his house for dinner. The way the house is built is that the garage sits at the bottom of the house. There are a set of enclosed stairs leading from the upstairs to the garage, which is shaped like an upside down L with a large metal door sealing off the entrance to the stairs at the bottom. And just adjacent to the large metal door is the entrance door which leads outside. Since the entrance door had quite a few locks to get through, and I was not prepared to go back up to fetch the keys, we decided to go through the garage as it was the quickest way through. The garage door itself is not an electric one and you have to manually lift it to open. I open the large metal door and switch on the light which is situated right next to the large metal door on the right as you enter. My cousin and I open the garage door as it's very heavy and I proceed to move to switch the light off with my cousin behind me waiting. As I approach the light switch next to the large door, the handle slowly starts to move up then down. I thought it was my brother who had told us that he was going to join us for dinner later on. I quickly open the door expecting to see him but no one was there. No sound of anyone running up to the stairs, as the sound would without a doubt echo through the enclosed stairway. You had to have tremendous speed, which is not humanly possible, and be as quiet as a cat to ascend without being noticed from where I was standing. I had to ask my cousin if he witnessed the same thing, just to make sure I wasn't crazy. He did see the same thing I saw, 
We were both baffled. I tried to explain it in every conceivable way, that the door handle slowly went down and up. Maybe the spring jammed? I ruled that out since the handle would spring back up abruptly. Maybe a small animal was able to put weight on the handle? No, because it takes considerable force to push it down. Eventually, I started to believe it was a truly paranormal force, which might have been my grandfather, as the garage area was where he spent most of his time. I'm not a person who believes in the supernatural, but I've explored all avenues of thought. When I was 13 months old, I lost my father to some suspicious circumstances, possible murder. So I unfortunately never got the luxury to have a strong relationship with him. However, I vividly remember his face, his laugh, and many memories of us playing together. Even stranger was that my memories from the house my mother and I moved into after we passed in our old home. I remember playing games, tea party, and even dressing up with him. But the oddest part was that the photos my mom took of me when I was playing with him, there would always be an orb next to me, same color, shape, and size. My mom always thought it was the camera, but it was never in the same spot. Fast forward to when I was about six years old. I remember it was Christmas Eve, so I was excitedly waiting for Santa Claus to come. I just remember what felt like someone kissing me goodnight. And when I sat up excitedly to see, whom I hoped was Santa, lol, instead I saw this extremely bright light coming from the hall. Now my mother was laying in bed next to me, fast asleep, and we had nobody else in the house. But I just remember watching it in awe, as it was a beautiful blue flash of light that seemed to open and then close. I remember writing it off as Santa leaving, so I excitedly woke my mother up to go open my presents. It was about 3 a.m. Now, obviously, as I got older and learned that Santa wasn't real, I questioned what I saw that night. It wasn't a car light, an electrical malfunction, or a TV that was accidentally turned on. And after mentioning it to my mother as an adult, I truly believe I watched him cross over. My reasoning? My mother told me in high school that she believed my dad's spirit was with me in the house. She said it was okay at first, but that she thinks he was playing tricks on her, like he did when he was alive. And hearing me talk to him all the time and seeing the orbs in all my photos began to freak her out. Well, it turned out that night, Christmas Eve, her best friend who had come for dinner had helped her cleanse the spirit away. And that after she did, I never mentioned my father or played with him again. My mother wrote off my seeing the bright light as my crazy childhood imagination. But as horrible as my memory is from my childhood, the feeling and image I got from that light that night has always felt so real and raw to me. I still remember the feeling of peace and happiness that washed over me when I saw it. And now, 17 years later, I believe wholeheartedly I watched my dad cross over. So I'm pretty sure I watched my dad cross over. So all this strangeness started about three months ago. My wife and I started seeing and hearing strange things around the house. Footsteps, muted voices in the walls, etc. For a while, we were convinced that someone was living in our attic. But after having some fellow church members go up there for repairs, we know that's not the case. At one point, our walls were vibrating rhythmically, almost like a phone. But we had both of our phones and knew it wasn't any of our devices. These are things that I experienced as well, not just my wife. We also had another shared experience involving a video baby monitor through which we could see floating orbs that would dance together in an intelligent way, always over the baby's crib. I know about cameras and it wasn't due to reflections or dust. 
We could see the orbs with our eyes, but they would appear through the monitor. So I went to where they were showing on the screen and put my hand out. And as we watched on the screen, they would converge on my hand and dance around my hand. It was the most bizarre thing. My wife has suffered from sleep paralysis and seen a lot of strange things, including about three or four unique demons or shadow people that would visit from time to time. They all looked different and had different feelings to them. The next morning, my wife would always tell me which ones had been present the night before. Sometimes they just stood and watched. Other times, they tried to get my wife to react to them in some way. There was even a time when a light slash good one came and talked with one of the dark ones. She says that one in particular that comes that just stands for a very long time, and the only word she has for it is that it's curious and trying to learn about us. She says that one has been coming more regularly, and it just gives off this intense vibe of trying to learn about us for some nefarious purpose. She says if she ignores them, they go away much faster. So she's gotten really good at pretending like they're not there. About a month or so ago, my wife was going to the bathroom in the night and saw a figure standing at the top of the stairs at the end of the hall. She described it as being totally solid looking, around five, six, with arms and legs that ended in points, not hands and feet. The head was almost totally spherical and was a lot larger than a normal human's head. It was standing on the floor, not floating above it. It wasn't blurry around the edges, but totally solid and crisp looking. She knew this was the same entity which had visited a number of times already, the curious one that was a scout of some kind. It was trying to learn about us. She said it turned and saw her looking, and as soon as it saw her, it turned and walked through a closed door that leads to my office. She said it just phased through it, like Harry and Ron going through the big barrier, leading to the Hogwarts Express. She continued to the bathroom, which butts up against the office, which is the next room over. The toilet is on the wall that is shared by both the bathroom and the office. She said the whole time she was on the toilet, she felt the entity in my office moving around and putting off a strange, darkly curious vibe. She said she almost got the courage to go barge into my office and confront it. But she decided she didn't want to agitate whatever it was, because she says they want her to react in some way. So she finished in the bathroom and came to bed and didn't sleep the rest of the night, listening for anything. She said soon after returning to bed, the feeling dissipated and it was gone. A few days later, my wife started hearing a specific low growling voice that told her to physically harm herself and that no one loved or cared about her. The voice wasn't in her head, but out in the open room somewhere. She said it was from one of the same beings she would see in her sleep paralysis episodes. I didn't experience anything like this during this time, however, but I am not at all sensitive to anything paranormal so I wouldn't expect to be able to see or hear anything anyway. Okay, now this is where things start to get really interesting. And this is where I started to witness some of the strangeness firsthand. In addition to the initial strange things my wife and I both experienced near the beginning. So a week later, during her morning shower, my wife said an entity came into the bathroom and started trying to engage her in conversation. It was taunting her. It wasn't visible, but she could feel it. It was again one of the beings she would feel or see during her sleep paralysis. She said it wasn't speaking verbally, but in thoughts. It wanted to get a response from her, but she ignored it and said it stayed in the room until she was done, getting angry at her and coming up directly behind her. Then it followed her out of the room when she was done but then disappeared off into the house somewhere and she came downstairs. I had been watching our two sons while she was in the shower. She came down and I could tell there was something wrong. But all she said was, I want to tell you something later. At the time, 
I didn't know anything about what she had experienced, which makes what happened next even stranger. A moment later, my younger son, who's one and a half, reaches up toward the stairs and starts pointing frantically. His finger is following something invisible as it moves across the room. His eyes are wide and he's trying to get down from my wife's lap. Right then, my older son, who's three, reaches up and begins to point also. And I notice they are both pointing in the same direction and following it with their eyes, as if they're watching someone walking across the room. My younger son finally wiggles free and starts running across the room toward whatever they've been pointing at. Then my older son, who speaks very clearly, says, look, Gabriel is following that man into the dining room. My older son then follows and they both walk into the dining room. I follow them and see my younger son pulling frantically at a bookshelf we use for our Bibles and Bible study groups, like dictionaries and concordances and things like that. I pick up my older son and ask him what they are looking at. He said, that man sitting on the Bible shelf. Both the boys were acting so strangely and started acting really wild for a few minutes until they calmed down. And after that, it was as if they had both forgotten about the entire thing. Fast forward three more days until last night, when something happened that was so strange and shook me up so much that I just had to get some advice on it. So my wife went up to put our younger son to bed, and I stayed down with our older son to read him from his little kid's Bible, like I always do before bed. We read the story of Jesus healing the ten lepers, and my son made a connection he never had before. He said, Jesus can heal people. Jesus loves me. I was proud of my son because of his insights for someone so young, and I told him I was proud of him. He just so happened to be holding a little wooden palm cross that he had been carrying around all day as a toy. I used this as a teaching moment and told him that the cross he was holding was a reminder that Jesus loves him. He held the cross tightly and said, Jesus loves me. It was all very touching as a parent, and so I hugged him and we headed up to brush his teeth. Well, after brushing his teeth and putting on a nighttime diaper and putting on his pajamas, we settled down into the rocking chair next to his crib for a bedtime story before I tucked him in. He kept interrupting the story I was telling him by tightly holding the cross which I decided to let him take to bed, and telling me it meant Jesus loves him. I acknowledged what he was saying each time and patiently continued the story. Then something happened that stopped me in my tracks. My son started looking over the ceiling and holding his cross closer to his chest. His eyes were moving around like he was watching something, but I didn't see anything. He kept this up until he said, no, you can't have my cross. I said, who are you talking to? And he said, that man up there, he says I can't have my cross. At this point, I'm a little shaken, but decide we're going to talk about the cross again. I tell him what it means, and I suggest we sing Jesus Loves Me. As we're singing, my son starts to whimper and looking up. I asked him what he was looking at, and he said, that man, he says my cross is bad. At this point, I picked my son up and held him as we walked over to where he was pointing. He was pointing at something around six foot six high. I walk right over to where he's pointing, and as I do, my son writhes back in horror. I said, is he right there? And I reached out my hand to where the head would have been according to where my son was looking and pointing. He says, yes, Dada, don't, he's getting mad. Then my son looks all around like the thing I had just touched was now whirling around us until it peered to a stop right in front of us. I looked right where it should have been according to where my son was looking and I said in a firm, confident voice, get out of here, now. I didn't yell, I just said it. Then I took my son and we sat back down on the rocking chair. I continued the story and my son appeared fine for a little while until he started looking towards a specific spot and making whimpering sounds again. He said, that man is very mad. He wants my cross. Right after that, my son starts screaming at the top of his lungs. And then all of a sudden, 
The cross he's been holding this whole time flies out of his hands with intense force and goes flying across the room like it had been thrown hard. My son is crying and screaming at this point, and so I did the only thing I could think of. I told whatever was in the room to leave by the authority of Jesus Christ. I said it firmly. My son stopped screaming almost right away and cuddles into me. That man went away, he said. I calm my son and tell him another story until he's sleepy, and then I lay him on his bed and leave the room. But just hold on a second, because this story is about to get weirder. Now this was more than I had ever had happen to me before. I mean, that cross flew across the room like it had been ripped from my son's hand with strong force. I didn't know what to make of it, but it had got a lot stranger when I went into our bedroom to talk to my wife. As soon as I walked into the room, my wife, with fear in her eyes, said, you'll never guess what happened to me and Gabe when I was putting him to bed. At that point, my heart sank because I knew what I had just experienced. I didn't say anything, but just let her talk. She said she was just getting our younger son sleepy in his room and she heard Gideon start screaming. She said right after he stopped screaming, she felt a palpable wave of total evil sweep through the room. She described it like a shockwave of evil energy that came blasting from our older son's room. She said it passed through her and our younger son, and at that very moment, he started writhing. My wife was thrown back by the force of it, and she said it was the worst, most evil, horrible thing she'd ever experienced, and she could feel it in her bones as she described it. She said she will never forget that feeling of total evil and pure hatred sweeping across the room. She said she felt it right after my older son stopped screaming. I just stood and listened to what she was saying. Before I told her anything about what I had experienced, it didn't take me long to realize that our timelines matched up exactly. The moment she felt the wave of pure evil blast from out of our room, of our older son's room, was the exact moment I had commanded it to leave by the authority of Jesus. I stood there, shocked for a while, before I said, I have something to tell you also. We better go downstairs and talk. As we walked down the stairs, I saw something I hadn't noticed before. On the floor were some shapes made of black masking tape that my wife made for the boys to jump on yesterday. They had been jumping from shape to shape to learn about the shapes. Well, the two most prominent, which were in the middle of the room and the largest of all, were a cross and what was supposed to be a star, but was actually a pentagram. I had noticed the shapes earlier in the day but I hadn't noticed that one was a pentagram. I'm not saying this had anything to do with it, but it's so strange we had an apparently demonic experience involving a cross the exact same day those symbols were on the floor of the living room. Needless to say, I ripped them up off the floor after that. Soon after, we heard our older boy screaming again from upstairs and we ran up there. He said that another man was trying to take his cross. It was then that I remembered hearing someone say that sage is supposed to help with stuff like this. My wife has a few essential oils and a diffuser laying around for stress relief, but we hadn't used them in a long time. So I had her to go get it and put some sage and frankincense in it and put the diffuser in my older son's room. It calmed him down immediately and he went soundly to sleep and slept the entire night after that. So in 2016, I bought a car. I hadn't owned one in three years because my other one was stolen and I couldn't afford to replace it. I woke up that day just knowing my car was out there. I'd been looking very lightly for a couple of months, but I knew I just would know when the time was right. Sure enough, that day I saw my car on Craigslist. One owner, high mileage, but well-maintained, $800. I had a budget of 1200 so it was perfect. The couple were fantastic, just really nice people who said, we knew this car would write the, find the right owner, and it's you. The car is going to get you in the next phase of your life. Six years later, and I'm still driving this car. It's fantastic. It was flawlessly maintained, 
and will serve me for years to come, I'm sure. I even wrote the owners a couple of years ago to give them an update. Great people. So two years ago, I was involved in a little fender bender. I had moved 100 miles away from LA, where I had bought the car. And where I live now, we have rough winters, feats of snow, etc. So I'm coming around this curve and suddenly hit a patch of ice on a day that was 60 degrees, so I wasn't expecting it. And side swipe a car parked alongside the road. Their car had more damage than mine, and it was obviously my fault as I had skiddled something like 50 feet and managed to merely side sweep instead of T-bone them. We took photos of each other's insurance cards, I call it in, etc. My car is fine except for a cracked headlight. Well, the next day, the insurance guy calls me. The card belongs to a couple who were not in your town at the time. Me and the AAA guy were puzzled. And a few days later, he lets me know that the card belonged to a couple who had some stuff stolen from their car the week before, nowhere near the accident. This obviously implies that the people I ran into had been the thieves. I probably never know. I never heard anything else about it. My insurance went up about $5, and the car I had hit was a rental, so I don't hear anything else about it. Fast forward to this evening. I'm going through my email attachments trying to find a photo, and I stumble on the pics of the insurance card the couple had given me. I notice the names. The name of the man is a Spanish name, his full name. I'll say the name on the card was Eduardo, but... It was the former owners of my car. I hadn't connected the two at the time because of the Spanish name, and I had only known him as Ed. So I wrote the owners and said, perhaps the car dropped on the ground for my car. I have no explanation. He writes back 10 minutes later, call me immediately. I have the explanation, amazing. I just got off the phone with them. The insurance card didn't belong to my own car so it didn't fall out upon impact. It was for their other car, and they had indeed had someone steal a lunchbox and wallets from their car in Pasadena a week before my accident. Of all the millions of people in SoCal, I somehow managed to sideswipe people who were somehow in possession of a stolen insurance card that belonged to the freaking former owners of my car. That's a hundred miles away from Pasadena. All of our minds are blown, and this is so rare of a occurrence that I can't help but think it's mathematically on par with being bitten by the same shark on the same leg at the same time 20 years later or something. Ed kept saying, this is a good omen. This is incredible. What a good omen. I mean, I knew the car was meant for me, but this is beyond the beyond. My uncle began finding pieces of dog bones wrapped tightly in red cloth around the precarious corners of the house. A tantric confirmed that this was a manifestation of black magic and that one of grand aunts who lived in the ancestral village had been doing it. He also told us that the ritual performed on our family involved stuffing a live chicken inside a matka, earthen pot, and then burying it deep inside the earth. Now, in our case, the matka, called Marin Patra, killing bowl, had been buried seven hastas, handful deep. This meant that the ritual was irreversible and similar to a kamikaze attack would affect the caster too later in life. But my grandmother was in denial that her sister could do something so ghastly and forbade us from confronting her. This specific grand aunt had always been jealous of my grandmother because she was sterile. On the other hand, my grandmother had three sons, which in the socio-patriarchal society of Bihar was considered extremely desirable. When my uncle was an infant, he'd start running high fever whenever they visited the ancestral village. The fever would subside as soon as a protective locket was placed around his neck, given to my grandmother by a temple priest. Once, my uncle was running a high temperature even when the locket was firmly in place. When contacted, the priest calmly told my grandmother that someone had removed the yantra, the comic diaphragm, placed inside the locket, and that he'd been sending her a new one. The locket did indeed turn out to be empty. 
My aunt passed away after a short illness in 2019, leaving behind her two-year-old son. We didn't suspect any foul play, although what happened in the next few days led us to believe we were missing something. In Hindu tradition, a 13-day period of mourning, Tahavi, is declared from the day the loved one passes. Throughout these 13 days, our house was behest with paranormal activity. Toys placed near the baby's crib would suddenly switch themselves on and make shrill noises. The baby would bounce around the crib as if some unseen force was trying to lift it and fall it failing. The utensil racks would start shaking in the middle of the night and lights would flicker for no apparent reason. A part of Tirai ritual involves offering a ball of flour to crows and other small animals whom we consider to be the reincarnation of our ancestors. In my aunt's case, the animals refused to come near the offerings, let alone partake in any of it. Most of the relatives insinuated that our aunt was still attached to her son and was so refusing to cross over. Then on the 13th day, our suspicions were confirmed when something happened that I'm still unable to explain to this day. On the first day of Taravi, an earthen lamp called Daya was lighted inside the bedroom where the deceased resided. On each successive day, the lamp is placed a little far from the bedroom and towards the exit door, symbolically giving a send off to the departed soul. On the final day, the lamp is to be placed outside the house, giving finality that the soul had crossed over. When my aunt's lamp was placed outside the house, the wick refused to catch fire. I say refused because we went through a box of matches trying to light the dyer, but in vain. Some of the oil spilled over on the box, rendering the leftover matches useless. Someone was sent outside to get a fresh box. Lighter and stove fire cannot be used since it's considered sacrilegious. Overtly religious aunts of the family began crying at this sight, when one of them struck upon an idea. For context, there is a Pranprithisit, life-infused idol of goddess Kali, enshrined in our home. My grandfather had requisitioned the, old, the, the idol from a Shakti worshipper in 1977, but couldn't bring her home till 1978, since Indira Gandhi had imposed emergency throughout India. He used to worship her by giving oblations of his own blood. So, for 40 continuous years, she has been worshipped by our family and treated as a mother. She's offered food twice a day, bathed and cleaned by the female members, and is offered a gold chain on every occasion. Once there was a great fire in the slum near our house, and our maid, who suffered serious burns, had lost everything in it. When we went to visit her in hospital, she fell at the feet of my grandmother, wailing and confessing that she had stolen a chair from the mother goddess's neck. And what happened to her was retribution. Another time, my mother didn't want to attend a wedding and prayed for her that she excused from the event. The next day, my mother's entire luggage that included her jewelry and finery was stolen from the train and she spent the entire day inside a police station rather than the wedding. I could go on and on about her stories, but I would confine myself to this event. Finally, one of my aunts rushed into Mother Carly's shrine and with folded hands screamed, Mother, please help her. To my surprise, the wick instantly caught flame. The rest of the ri rituals performed were uneventful. Throughout his life, my grandfather lived in a village near Hazarabi in Ranchi, Jakhand. Paranormal activity was a common occurrence and a part of life where he resided. There was a superstition among the natives of the village that a woman who dies while pregnant would become a child ale, witch. The only way to prevent this was by crossing the arms of the corpse and driving a long nail through both of them. Once in the early 1960s, when my grandfather was around 14, a pregnant woman who lived in the neighborhood passed away. Usually, the corpse is cremated, but due to the superstition, the villagers dare not come near it. Hence, they left her body under a nearby banyan tree. Rumors began circulating throughout the village that they had forgotten to put a nail through the corpse, 
and that the woman would now become a Tudale. The rumors reached the ears of the schoolboys, and being reckless teenagers, they dared each other to drive a nail through the corpse. Enough taunts from his mates led my grandfather into accepting the challenge. At midnight, he reached the banyan tree with a nail, quickly crossed the arms of the corpse and hammered it in. Then he ran away into his house and slept throughout the night. He was woken up by his mother screaming at him. What did you do? Where were you last night? She said, Mother, I haven't done anything, he lied. You drove a nail through her corpse, didn't you? She inquired. How do you know about that? He said, bewildered at his mother's knowledge. Last night at around 3 a.m., someone began knocking on the door. I thought it was some emergency and decided to open it. Our neighbor, who'd just passed away, was standing outside and crying profusely. I felt scared, but mustered up the courage to ask her what was wrong. She told me what she had always treated you like a son, and that you disrespected her by putting a nail through her. She told me to ask you what had done to suffer such fate. After saying this, she disappeared. My great-grandmother concluded. My grandfather felt very guilty for what he had done. He removed the nail from her corpse, gave her a proper cremation, and performed all rituals that are supposed to be performed by his son. The first one I remember is from when I was only a couple months or even weeks old. I remember having a fully developed adult consciousness and feeling like I was stuck inside of a baby's body. My mom would wrap me in a sheet as a baby so that I couldn't move whatsoever. A lot of Eastern European parents did that in the 90s. I wanted to scream out for help but didn't know language yet so I just lay there terrified and imprisoned, wondering how I got into that tiny body. The next one I remember was when I was around six or seven. I was playing with a friend of mine in my room, laughing and just doing normal kid things. When all of a sudden, I felt like I had to look up into one corner of the room. And in that moment, I felt something enter me. Everything inside me changed in that moment and almost kind of sank. Whatever that entity was, it felt dark and I was never the same afterward. I have had a lifelong history of being bullied, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, dark fantasies, and illegal substance dependency. The next experience is probably the most terrifying one I remember, and I remember it vividly. When I was little, my parents would often send me to Finland to spend the summer with my grandparents. We lived in Estonia. When I was nine, they decided to send me to Russia instead, so I'd spend it with my great aunt. My great aunt had an old cottage style house and a sauna on her property. One time, my great aunt and grandmother told me we would all be going to the sauna, but asked me not to speak after we leave it. I said I wouldn't. We went into the sauna and my great aunt sat me down on a bench. They kneeled down in front of my face and said some weird words, after which I fell into a trance like state. I was still awake but everything around me was hazy, like in a dream. Then my grandmother lay down on one of the top benches and my great aunt started cracking chicken eggs and putting other stuff in my grandmother's body. I tried to move my body but couldn't. However, I managed to turn my head a little to the right and noticed a massive mirror standing against the wall on the floor. So as I'm looking at it, that mirror lifted off the ground and started floating in small circles in a clockwise direction. I did not dream it happened. It really happened. I remembered it so clearly. I felt like screaming in terror in that moment, but I couldn't. My mouth was shut and couldn't move. Once my great aunt and grandmother were done whatever they were doing, we showered, got dressed and left the sauna. At that point, I completely forgot about my promise not to seek. So I blurted out something like, well, that was actually really nice. And they got so angry with me. Only years later did I found out they were actually during a youth spell. And to talk about doing something like that was to null it or make it void. That's why they were angry. 15 years after that incident, when I was visiting my grandmother in Finland, 
I asked her about that day and also if she was into witchcraft. She pretended she didn't know what I was talking about and denied it. My mom claims that my grandma is a witch and a powerful one. The next experience was extremely odd and one of the happiest moments of my life. I moved to the UK with my dad when I was 10. We lived in a city called Southampton. In Southampton, there was this huge, beautiful park. I can't remember what it's called, but it was massive. I used to love walking all over it by myself. Being a new immigrant kid, I didn't have many friends and was an introvert anyway, preferring my own company. One evening when I was walking, I walked right along an old cemetery that was on the park grounds. It was golden hour and the light was shining through the trees in such a magical way. It was absolutely stunning. As I was walking, I felt a certain grave call out to me and ask me to come near it, so I did. The grave told me to lie down on it, so I did. Then, in a state of absolute bliss, I fell asleep. That was practically the best nap of my life. I woke up with a feeling of such overwhelming happiness that I cried, thanked the grave and left. The next experience was interesting. My dad and I emigrated from the UK to Canada by our sailboat. Our first stop was in La Coruña, Spain. There, we met the crew of a Ukrainian container ship that was on quarantine and became very good friends with them. There was a woman on board who was a chef. Apparently she took my dad aside and in secret and told him I have a special gift, as in something related to occultism or spiritualism. Dad only told me about this after we left port. As I got older, these experiences decreased. I get the occasional deja vu, but haven't had a paranormal experience in a while. I think it's something when you are more open to it as a child, and as an adult, you somehow become closed off to that world. Has anyone else experienced events throughout their life? This happened in Pennsylvania, in the Alleyne National Forest in 2009-10, I don't remember exactly. It was when the National Rainbow Gathering was there. I was hitchhiking the East Coast at the time and made my way there. Ran into a buddy I had met in Florida a few months before and she was there with a friend, so they adopted me and I camped with them. Me and Dana decided to camp alongside the main trail to get away from all thousands of hippies. The main trail goes from a camp, the parking lot, to the main circle in the heart of the gathering and it's a couple mile trek. So we were out there alone besides the main trail traffic. It was dusk and we were having a heavy talk about spirituality and whatnot, hippie stuff, when we decided to go down to the main circle to get some food. You were st we were standing up and I began to stomp out the little twig fire we had when Anna said, do you hear that? I stopped and listened and it sounded like someone walking in the forest towards us. At this same moment, pe some people on the main trail had stopped and were smoking cigarettes and were talking amongst themselves, oblivious to us. Me and Anna listened to these footsteps quickly moving into view and we could see nothing. The footsteps kept going and there was nothing there. My mind was misfiring trying to figure it out. We could actually see the footfalls of twigs snapping and leaves moving. Whatever it was went right up to those people on the trail and seemed to slow its pace. Like it was checking them out. They were totally oblivious to this, talking to each other in a circle. Then it just came right up to me and Anna and slowed down like it was checking us out. I wasn't scared, just really confused, frozen to the spot. The entire time, Anna was fumbling with a keychain she had got with a million things attached to it and finally found this little flashlight and shown it and said, hey. Whatever it was, it was a feet away from me, bounded off up the hill very fast. If I wanted to run after it, I couldn't have it was really fast. Like the steps became machine gun steps. Me and Anna took off down the hill, totally panicked. To me, it sounded like a child spread, walking, if that makes sense. The steps were short, but fast, almost like robotic-like, or insect-like. This really happened, and Anna would refuse to talk about it after, 
She was totally freaked. I had to go back up and pack, pack up the camp. We live in Utah and my uncle Mark went on a mission at 19. They sent him to an Indian reservation in Arizona. They paired him up with a companion named Carl. When they first got there, there was a huge rift with the locals on the reservation with them being there. They didn't want my uncle and Carl staying on the reservation grounds. Eventually, they came to a compromise that they would stay on the outskirts in a trailer. This reservation wasn't very big and was located next to a heavily wooded area. The first night, they were trying to sleep when all of a sudden, their trailer started to shake violently back and forth. Startled and not sure what was happening, they climbed under their table for cover. Mark could distinctively hear someone pushing it from both sides of the trailer, like a group of people. After about five minutes, it stopped. The next day, they made rounds on the reservation and were talking to the locals. Carl made a comment to one of the families that their trailer was shaking that night before. The family got very quiet and then told them they had to leave. They thought it was strange, but didn't think much of it. The next night, it happened again. They awoke to their trailer shaking back and forth. Again, they climbed under the table until it stopped. This went on for two more nights. Anytime they tried to talk to anyone about it, they got quiet and told them to leave. Mark started thinking that due to the tension of their arrival, the locals were doing this to scare them off the reservation. They then go into a convenience store and they were talking together about how frustrated they were with the situation. The clerk overheard and said, they can't talk about it, it's forbidden. Confused, they ask him, can't talk about what? The guy continues to tell them about the shin walkers. He says they are evil demons that were once born Native American white witches. If they talk about it, the skinwalkers will come for their souls. They just walked out of there baffled. They thought it was another scare tactic. So that night, when the shaking started again, my uncle decided to be brave and confront them. He went to the trailer door, flung it open and yelled, hey. When he did that, he saw these three animals run off. Two were a wolf and one was a bear. But they looked strange almost with like human features. As he watched them run towards the trees, all three stood up on two legs and walked slowly towards the trees, making a human cackling laugh. It scared him so bad that they called their mission president the next morning and asked to be moved. They were relocated for a day. For a year, nothing happened. One day, they announced that Carl was being relocated to another city and Mark was getting a new companion, Jimmy. They had to drive about an hour to pick Jimmy up from the airport. The road they traveled went through the boundaries of the reservation. They arrived at about 8 p.m. and met Jimmy, and they got to leave. The mission president tells Jimmy, we're driving through a dangerous area at night, so we can't make any stops. If you need to reach the restroom, you need to go now. Jimmy says, I'm fine. The mission president gets serious enough to even freak out Mark. I'm not kidding, go do your business. Jimmy was insistent this time. So they hit the route. As they're about 30 minutes into the drive, they were going through the area of the reservation boundaries. Jimmy starts complaining that he needed to pee badly. The mission president says, we can't stop here. You'll just have to hold it. Jimmy keeps going on. I really can't hold it. So the mission president stops the car and says, okay, but you will do your business next to the door. And I say, get into the car. You better get into the car fast. With a look of confusion, Jimmy says, all right. Opens the door and starts to do his business. About five seconds later, the mission president says nothing and just yanks Jimmy into the car and floors it. Jimmy and Mark start freaking out saying, what's going on? The mission president says nothing and just increases his speed. All of a sudden, what is going on? The mission president says nothing and just increases his speed. All of a sudden, 
Mark sees something next to the car on his right. A giant wolf-looking man was running on two feet next to the car. Man looked at the speedometer. They were going over 60 miles an hour and still increasing. The wolf creature kept right next to the car for 10 minutes until it finally took off into the trees. Shaking, Jimmy gets out of the car when they arrive. They didn't speak through the whole ordeal and says, what did I just see? The mission president says, next time, I tell you to take care of your business, you take care of your business. When I first met my now husband, I was young, naive, and too curious of a person for my own good. At the time, I was newly pregnant and we were living in an apartment with my sister. One day, we were in a conversation about the paranormal. As a child, I had many things happen that I couldn't explain or that were terrifying and we were telling stories. My husband was being super skeptical about every story told. So me and my sister, being ignorant, suggested we go buy a Ouija board and show him that spirits were real. I had heard horror stories about the board, even from my own father, but I was that person that had to find out for myself. Oh, how naive and stupid I was. I now realize. We bought a board and at first, we took it to a park to try it out, trying to separate it from home. Nothing was happening and we were getting frustrated. So we left for home. After we got home, my sister kept going on about trying it again. Eventually we agreed and took it to my bedroom to play despite my hesitation. After a few minutes of no response, the planchet eventually moved to yes after asking if any spirits were there. We were pretty excited that it was moving and even tried to debunk if the other could move if it to be funny. Right away, the planchet wouldn't answer questions, but kept moving in a figure eight motion over and over. We eventually got tired of its lack of response and gave up. A few days later, my sister came to me upset and said that the night before, her door was shaking violently. It was closed and it was like someone was pushing the door back and forth. She seemed pretty freaked out. I just listened, but in my mind, I wasn't perceiving it as that big of a deal. A few nights later, my husband and I were laying in bed trying to sleep. All of a sudden, our bedroom door started to shake back and forth, just like my sister described. But it was definitely not as minor as I thought. The door was shaking rapidly and violently. I woke my husband and said, look at the door. He just stared at it and said, what the hell? We watched it shake for a few minutes and then it eventually stopped. When it did stop, my husband got up and looked out in the hall and checked on my sister. No one was there and she was fast asleep. We just kind of shook it off. For months, the door shaking happened to one of us almost every night. We started staying at my parents' house more often just to avoid the freaky nights. One night, I was about seven months pregnant at this time. I had taken my husband's kids to school that morning. He has two kids from a previous marriage and I was extremely tired that morning. So when I returned home, I decided to go back to bed for a little while. I was sleeping when I was all of a sudden awoken with the feeling of something crawling or walking along my feet on the bed. I sat up and looked, nothing was there. I thought I just dreamed it and fell back asleep. Then I was awoken again thinking something was crawling or walking towards me on the bed. I sat up and again, nothing was there. I told myself it was a dream again and laid back down. I was trying to fall back asleep when I felt it again. This time I wasn't asleep. It felt like when a cat is walking towards you on a bed, very light but distinct like paws. We don't have a cat or any animal due to my severe allergies to them. I shot up in bed and looked, but saw nothing there. That time I was really freaked out and realized I wasn't dreaming the first two times I felt it either. I got out of that apartment so fast and refused to go back in until my husband got home. It really shook me up. We moved out of that apartment about a month later. I do believe that something attached to us 
as we have had a lot of freaky experiences still since using that board. But that's for another long story. I'd be happy to share if people are interested. I still wonder if tenants still have the door shake at night in that apartment, or if it left with me. I won't ever play with a Ouija board again. It started roughly a week ago and has happened multiple times. First of all, I want to mention that I live alone and I don't have any pets. Last week, I went to sleep around 2 a.m. and I had my MacBook Pro closed completely on the floor. While I was in bed, I started to hear typing on the keyboards. It wasn't cracking or anything like that. It was typing and I'm not imagining it at all. It lasted several minutes and then eventually stopped. I freaked out like crazy that night, but eventually managed to fall asleep. The next day, I also went to bed late. I fell asleep and woke up in the middle of the night by the typing noise of the keyboard. It wasn't a dream, nor am I crazy. It really happened. I was very scared, so I turned on the lights and the typing stopped. My computer was still closed and shut down. So I turned off the lights and 10 minutes later, I heard the typing on my keyboard again. This time too, it lasted for a long time. I almost had a panic attack. Keep in mind, I live alone. It happened again on other nights. Every time it happens after I go to sleep. It can be right after I fall asleep and put the MacBook down, or many hours later in the, in the early morning while I'm still asleep. It never happens while I'm using the keyboard myself. Last night I also couldn't sleep because I heard weird noises coming from the window, like some weird gush of wind, loud noises around my windows and of course the typing on my computer. I'm terrified, what can that be? I was thinking I'm either spied by some agency that managed to infiltrate my computer and search for something, but what? I've got nothing to hide and I'm a completely average guy, never committed any crime whatsoever. And even then, if the computer is closed, how can I hear the typing? I mean, even if they infiltrated, I shouldn't hear typing on my keyboard. Or is it something paranormal? I read I'm not the first guy who heard the type of typing of keyboard at night, and other people who experienced it were equally frightened. Some of them use the mechanical keyboard, which is exposed at night. I have a MacBook Pro and my keyboard isn't exposed because at night I close my PC in the sense that I shut the screen above my keyboard so it's not exposed. Help me figure out what it can be. So for some context, my dad passed away at the very end of January this year. I suspect it was an accidental overdose because of his substance abuse issues, but no one in the family wanted to look further into it, so we never got a further autopsy. I think his autopsy note said something like a heart attack. He usually texted and called me daily and saw me weekly, but after not texting me for a few days, I got worried and called the police to do a welfare check. An hour later, they called back with the news. Unfortunately, he is deceased. Those words run through my head now all the time. I had deep regrets when he passed. He was, also a, he was always a hypochondriac and also just coming up with excuses and minor problems that only I could be able to fix, i.e. the Netflix was broken, he usually just didn't know how to restart the PS3 when the app crashed, or my rabbit who we cared for was sick. So when he texted me at odd hours, a couple days before I called the police, saying that my rabbit wasn't eating, I didn't take him very seriously. I had met him for lunch a day before he stopped responding and he was very shaky and said he wasn't feeling well. But he said that weekly, so I figured I had no reason to worry. It's been the same story for years. I was wrong. Once I got that phone call back saying he was gone, my world stopped. For the past several months, I've been fairly in denial. I went through his belongings after it happened, but my family weren't interested in helping, and we ultimately ended up hiring a lady to do an estate sale for us. I grabbed what I could think to hold on to, 
and ended up with a lot of stuff in boxes that I hadn't looked through too well. This will be relevant later. A few weeks ago, I had a dream. I haven't dreamed of him since he passed. When it first happened, I wished to see him one last time. But as time went on, I began to give up on seeing his ghost or presence again. That idea fully faded away, so I'm forever grateful for this experience I was given weeks ago. I dreamed that I was in a house I didn't recognize. It was clearly very old. My dad was born in 1947, if that holds any relevance to this house being so old. I walked up to a kitchen island and sat at a bar stool, which is when I see my dad, easily 20 years younger, walk out of a room opposite from me. A small brown and white dog I had never seen before comes out with him. I remember not being able to identify the breed, but the characteristics of the dog burned into my memory. Black nose, fluffy, brown with white or blonde patches and very small. He followed the dog walking towards me. I forget how the conversation started, but I know I began crying rather quickly. He looked so good. He was wearing a long sleeve blue platinum dress shirt he used to wear a long time ago. I cried and he asked me, what's wrong kiddo? I'm better now, you don't believe me? And I responded with, I do believe you. You look happier and healthier. That's why I'm crying. He told me not to worry, he would be okay and so would I. And then he said goodbye, left the door, and I woke up sobbing. It was a good bit of closure for me, and I've hung on to it since it happened. I figured my mind was creating that memory for me, to cheer me up and provide me that closure. But two days ago, I started sorting through some stuff that's been in boxes for several months, and I came across a folder I don't remember. It was full of old pictures, his old girlfriends in the 60s and 70s, cars and stuff. I didn't remember grabbing it, but it was a nice bit of memories to hold on to. One picture stood out though. It made me genuinely lose my breath and tear up when I saw it. That exact same little dog from that dream who I'd never seen in my life. A photograph that was decades old. I texted my aunt and she confirmed that it was one of my favorite little dogs. I forget what she said his or her name was. I didn't even tell her what had happened. I described the dog and she told me how much he loved that dog without skipping a beat. I like to believe it really was my dad in that dream. He had the strength to come back and bring one of his favorite pups along with him because he was a huge animal lover and I wouldn't expect it any other way. I don't know what I believe happened to us with everything is over. But I believe wherever he is, he's happy. And I'm forever thankful for that. While I was still in college, I was going through a major breakup. I started experiencing aura headaches. They made it so I couldn't speak, text, type or write. It was super difficult because my roommates at the time were involved in the breakup mess and the headaches made me look insane. One night, I got in the shower after feeling like a sad sack all day. I felt this sudden sense of clarity. I thought I realized I need to take a break and head to my parents' house. I was so calm after the shower, it felt amazing. My thoughts hadn't been clear since the breakup. To be honest, before I took the shower, I had no idea what day it was. The clarity was so nice and I felt so calm. I hurried up and packed and was out the door around half 10 in the evening. It felt like I was doing the right thing. It's important to note that there were two ways to get to my parents' house from my university. The first way started out with a big canyon that led to a couple small towns before connecting to the main freeway. I always took this route because it had cell phone service throughout the entire drive. I can't handle driving if I don't have phone service. The second way takes you towards a resort type town. There's nothing before. There's hardly any cell phone service until you pass a really sketchy four way stop. I've only taken the route once or twice, but only because a group of friends were going to the resort town. I never personally drove there because like I said, Having no cell phone service sketches me out when I drive. My car at the time was a Subaru Outback. 
and that thing usually blasted up the canyon. That night though, I couldn't get the car to go past 65 miles an hour. I was kind of worried, but I had an audiobook going, so I was calm. I was listening to a collection of Winnie the Pooh series, because it's innocent and it's what I needed. I'm headed up the first curve of the canyon, and I notice that the time is 11.11. I always make a wish around that time, so I made an embarrassing wish. I kept heading up the curve. Cars passed me for a bit. Suddenly, without a warning sign or anything, the lane merges into a side-by-side -side road. I realized nobody is behind me. And I'm freaking out because this one-lane business does not happen at all along this route. The curve starts to turn into alternating curves, and they're like the kind where you can't see if anyone's coming the other way. I continue driving because I don't know what else to do. I'm in a forested area and it's super dark. I'm getting spooked, so I decide to call my mom. I reach for my phone and it's not in the passenger seat where I usually put it. At this point, I'm freaking out. I lock my doors and pull over, turn on the cab light, and I literally tear my car apart looking for my phone. I look under seats, I even look in the back. It's nowhere to be found. Up until I pulled over, my audiobook was playing. I remember because it was the story where Pooh and Piglet keep circling the tree following their own tracks. Once I realize my phone is nowhere to be found, the audiobook stops playing. I'm in hysterics at this point. I look around in an attempt to ground myself. I decide the only thing I can do at this point is continue forward to see if a town doesn't pop up so I can figure out where I am. I continue driving, paying close attention to my surroundings. I then realize there are no freaking pine trees around me. I'm in the mountain west region in the US, and if you're in the middle of nowhere, the one thing you can count on seeing is pine trees, especially in wooded areas. All the trees have no leaves. They're not dead exactly, but there are no leaves and there's no small vegetation. I continue driving forward. The road is nothing but endless curves. I look at my gas gauge, worried about gas because usually it takes about half a tank to get to my parents, and I didn't want to break down. My gas tank is full, even though I didn't fill it up at all. There are no speed limits, no mileage markers. There's just curves, dirt, and leafless trees. Until finally, I pass by a house. More houses appear, and there's a church that pops into view. A church I used to go to as a kid, in a town about 40 miles away from my parents' place. The town isn't along the usual route I take. It's along the second route. And to get to this town, you have to turn abruptly at a four-way stop. I did no such thing. My audiobook turns on, and it's the part where Christopher Robin is asking Pooh to never forget him. I look over on my passenger seats and my phone is there. I look down at my gas gauge and it's only a quarter full. The time now says 3.30 a.m. My phone has 15 missed calls from my mom because I was technically on the road for four hours. When I call to talk to her, I'm experiencing an aura headache and this one in particular was super bad. It lasted two days. I think a lot of people will think I just had a mental breakdown, but I don't think so. I can't explain what happened to me. Maybe someone on here can. This story has developed over years. I want to warn you from the very beginning that some of it will be unbelievable. For that reason, I've been reluctant to share it. These events started to unfold when I was at a crossroads in my life. Let's just say I took a wrong turn, but I believe someone or something helped me find my way back. I was in the market for a place to rent and I was in a hurry. I knew of a mobile home that had sat empty since a friend of mine had gone to prison. There had been a few people move in, but they never stayed long. It was supposedly very haunted. It scared the crap out of most people, but I needed a place and was no stranger to the paranormal. I could handle it, surely. Not long after moving in, I began to wonder if that were true. Did I mention my friend had been convicted of murder and was serving a life sentence? Well, 
He told his sister when he found out that I had moved into his old place to tell me not to talk to them. They will make you do bad things. I considered what he said and realized it was too late for that because I had already been talking to them. That place was like Grand Central Station. You couldn't help but talk to them. There were two, however, that were scarier than the others. They were the only two that I could see clearly. One of them was very short, about four feet tall with a pale round face and what at the time appeared to be Batman ears. He wore what I thought was a long black coat or jacket. He was accompanied by a large, dense, blacker than black mass. That black mass scared me more than the thing with the face. Okay, they were both intense. After a couple of encounters with these guys, I decided it was time to go. I found a little cabin out in the woods for the same rent and jumped on it. I moved into the furnished cabin and never really paid much attention to the art that littered the walls. That's until I started to experience sleep paralysis. The painting that was always in front of me when I come out of those episodes started to look scary to me. The same two beings from the mobile home were visiting me through sleep paralysis. The painting was of two owls on a branch. One was smaller than the other and they always seemed to be staring at me intently. The first sleep episode was terrifying. The large black mass was pulling me, like trying to take me somewhere. The smaller of the two grabbed me, one hand around my throat and one hand under my arm, pulling back. The smaller one was trying to stop him. When I could move again, I could still feel his hands on me. That's when I noticed the painting and the way they stared at me. I was very confused by this incident. I just couldn't understand why one of them had saved me from whatever fate awaited me. I continued to have many other sleep paralysis episodes and other weird occurrences. It was as if I couldn't sit down in that house without falling asleep, even if I wasn't sleepy. My friends also felt this fatigue upon entering my abode. One of my friends had an episode of sleep paralysis, which I witnessed. I couldn't wake him up, even though he was looking right at me and mumbling something. He later told me that he could see me and hear me. He could also see something else, but couldn't tell me what it was. He said from his point of view, he was screaming and couldn't move no matter how hard he tried. All he said before leaving was, I'm sorry, I have to go. They're trying to kill me. He never visited me at that house again. It was around this time that I started to feel like these entities had attached to this painting for whatever reason. I thought, get rid of the painting, get some actual rest. So I decided to throw it out. A friend of a friend was over that day and said he wanted it. I told him it wasn't a good idea and why. He informed me that he didn't believe in that nonsense. I gave it to him reluctantly. I continued to see the entities in my dreams after that and always had the feeling that there was a presence with me. Now I know that's a vague statement, but I don't know any other way to put it. As I mentioned before, I took a wrong turn at that intersection I was at. I could no longer afford rent anywhere, so I kind of drifted after that. These two entities were with me every bit of the way, it seemed. Sometimes more than others, and I kind of got used to them. Fast forward about a year later, and about 250 miles from where this story began, I got myself stranded. I called a friend of mine from back home, and he made the three hour drive to rescue me. He would become my boyfriend and later my fiance. It was at his home that I encountered the owl painting for a second time, in his bedroom, facing the bed. So after the initial what the fuck, I began to wonder if maybe this was all for a reason. I began trying to communicate on a more regular and real basis with these entities. I now know that I have never communicated with the black mass. I still don't understand what it is. I do believe I have a better understanding of the other one. After lots of weird failures and successes at communication, a name was just kind of inserted into my head. It said, Inky. I heard it, just like you hear your conscience or whatever. I immediately began researching. The only thing I ever found was some weird demon cartoon. I thought, well, that's weird. 
but I didn't really feel like it was the answer. I kind of let it go after that. They were still there, but I tried to ignore them. Then I watched a movie. This movie changed everything. It got me interested in ancient Sumeria. I never dreamed that I would find the key to all of this there. In my research, I discovered that there was an Anunnaki being named Enki. It just clicked into place like a damn puzzle piece. Then when I discovered the things that Enki gets credit for, it made even more sense for me. The images of what Enki was thought to look like always depict him with two horn-like protrusions from the top of his head. The clothing wasn't too far off either. It seems Enki is thought to be responsible for the conifer tablets that deal with magic, exorcism, and lots of other interesting things. There is also a story that says he was banished to the underworld and was the one that would drag you there when you died. You can look all this up yourselves. It's very interesting. To this day, I don't understand why he would want to contact me. All I know is that after I made that discovery, he was gone. At least, I haven't seen him since. That's not to say he won't be back. I would like to add, though, that after all of these events, my life finally got on the right track. I'm still engaged to that friend that drove all the way to pick me up and had that same owl pick. Our lives were in the toilets when we got together and there wasn't much of a chance. We were going to change that. However, in the four years that we've been together, we went from a shack that was falling down around us to a three-story cabin on the river with a new Jaguar in the driveway. I can't help but wonder if we had some help getting together, if maybe that picture was a sign of some sort. The only thing I know for sure is that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. Did the weird journey happen by chance? Or was it a guided journey? As I said, I know this sounds outrageous. That's why I've never shared this before. First off, I think it's important to note a couple of things. My wife is from Australia and I'm from Midwest America. I'm 33 and she's 26. We've been married almost a year now and recently we had been talking about UFOs. I can't remember who told their story first, but I remember telling mine. When I was about nine years old, I was riding in the back of my grandparents' car headed back to town. Glancing out of the left back seat window, I saw an athletic man, basically an athletic swimmer's build, running as fast or faster than the car, which had to have been going about 30 or 40 miles an hour. My dad and uncle were in a truck in front of us and they stopped abruptly. My grandparents followed and pulled over as well. Dad and uncle got out and asked my grandparents if they saw something in the bushes, but they didn't describe anything just as if they saw something. This being country town America, I don't suppose they wanted to say what they actually saw. The thing is, the athletic running man with no clothes on running through the large bushes also had a bluish or metallic-like tint to his skin, almost like Silver Surfer from the comics, but different, as if he had a membrane around his body and the blue metallic color was underneath. As I told my wife this story, she started agreeing with me about hers. She told me that she was about eight. She was waiting for her mother outside. She saw an athletic looking man with no clothes on peeking through tall bushes and she described the exact same skin style as I did. I know this sounds how it sounds, but searching the internet for any similar sightings, all I can find is stuff about Atlanteans. I mean, to each their own, but I don't really believe in Atlantis. However, as I was talking about it, the whole thing of me remembering the swimmer's body type, it at least seemed like mentioning. I remember my grandparents saying they didn't see anything, but tomorrow I'm at least going to ask my grandmother if she remembers that day and pulling over the car to look for whatever my dad, uncle and myself saw. Also, if anyone else has ever seen such a thing, please let me know.
By the time I was 12 years old, I was no stranger to sleep paralysis. It seemed to be some sort of hereditary thing. As my mother told me before her father passed away, he finally told all his children about how sometimes when he would lay down to sleep, he would experience things. Said he would feel like something took him on a tour through what he considered to be hell. Once I was told this information, well, anyone who's experienced with sleep paralysis knows it spreads almost like a contagious virus to people. Just as my mother explained it to me, and that very night in the summer I had turned 12, began my lifetime with sleep paralysis. It would also affect my spouses over the years who didn't believe me. However, the night upon telling them, they would experience it. This story actually begins way before any of that. And the reason I brought it up was to set the stage for the fact I know the difference between being in sleep paralysis and being truly awake. See, I never believed in ghosts. I knew sleep paralysis was real and I knew its effects on the mind, body and soul. More importantly, in my time with it, I learned how to control it, how to manipulate it. And if I couldn't, then at the very least awake from it. This story to me is more unsettling. Compared to the first few weeks of active sleep paralysis as a kid, where I'd stay awake playing games until the sun came up, being in deep depression, drug use, and lots of pot smoking as a teen, it eventually overcoming the fear. Ultimately having some kind of rationale grasp on what sleep paralysis is, and the fact I do have control of it. This, this was something different. One morning in 2016, I woke up just like every other morning and walked over to my PC, turning it on to my favorite music of the time. Probably some kind of video game radio station like Fallout. I remember an old timey song playing as I scrolled through my favorite conspiracy theory sites. And it wasn't long into that morning, I had three very vivid flashbacks. They all took place in an old house my mother, brother and I used to live in back when she was a single parent. My family, an old Italian family, had made roots in our small little town in southern Oklahoma. The building, which was their restaurant, was an old house turned into a successful restaurant with add-ons over the years. That building had its own history and some type of energy with activity, but that's another story. We lived a few houses down from that building. The first flashback started out while I was as tall as my mother's knees. I was about four to five years old in all of these. My vision of FPV of running up to her while she was doing the dishes and grabbing her leg, not wanting to look towards the right, that's where a side entrance to the house was. I remember feeling like someone was standing in there, a tall man with a tall hat. The second flashback was me sitting in an old style bathtub, playing with my Robocop and Batman toys. All of a sudden, I became very scared a tingle shot up my spine and down my back, and the feeling of something staring into my back was so intense, I wanted to turn around. But at the same time, I was basically paralyzed from fright. The last flashback is by far the most unsettling. The house was just a normal, small squared house. All rooms were basically connected by doors, and my room was directly connected to the side entrance of the house I spoke about earlier. I had woken up from a dream of coming off of a train into a subway station where a bunch of people were walking around. When I woke up, I could see, even in almost pitch black room, a bunch of people standing all around my bed. I could feel them there. I could even he feel them swaying on the hardwood floor as it creaked and popped with the slightest movement. In my head, I knew it shouldn't make a sound. Like these things were waiting for me to, to see if I noticed them. I don't know why they were there. I don't know what they wanted. All I knew was I didn't want them to know I did in fact notice them. Luckily, as a child, I was able to drift off to sleep, waking up when the sun came up and being relieved. Now, 
After having these flashbacks, I was almost overcome with emotion, and I'm not a very emotional person. I called my mom and asked her about that house. I asked her if me or my brother ever mentioned anything about that place when we were kids. She paused for a moment and said, Yes, we were always talking about seeing things, hearing taps and scratches. Apparently, one night something happened with a babysitter, but the sitter wouldn't comment much, just got paid and left abruptly, and briefly mentioning someone outside all night. In the end, nothing more came of this. The house today is all burned and boarded up. I don't know of any history of the place. I only have my assumptions. The best I can gather is, this town I used to live in will probably sink into the ground someday due to all the coal mine tunnels beneath it. My mom's father actually worked in these tunnels to make up the seed money for the restaurant they eventually built. Lots of people and immigrants like him lost their lives in those tunnels, but also lots of crime took place in them as well. I'm still not sure I believe in ghosts, but the reason I felt compelled to share my experience is that something is in fact going on. Whether it's sleep paralysis or events like this, the world seems a bit larger than it feels sometimes. And whatever makes up our reality, maybe more malleable than most people like to think. My grandfather came from Italy with his parents in the 40s. They moved from New York to a small town in southeast Oklahoma. When he got older, he met my grandmother and long story short, they were able to build a house for them and their eventual 12 children. And after a few years of just having a carry out only restaurant, they bought a house in the late 70s to early 80s and turned it into their new restaurant. By this time, they had several grown children which all helped with the renovation of the place. A normal house to which they added on a big dining room. During the renovation, my uncles told me how, when they went upstairs, they found pentagrams made from chicken blood, chicken feathers, and books about the afterlife. When I was about eight, my mom, who was a single parent, took me one Saturday morning to the restaurant to pick something up. She left me in the dining room as she went to the back. After a few moments, which seemed like forever to an eight-year-old, I walked back into the kitchen to find her. I stopped at the drink room and got an overwhelming sense something was wrong. The walls felt like they were closing in around me, and I fell to the floor, crying. The next thing I remember was my mom running to me and asking me what was wrong. Over the years as I grew up, I would ask my family members about the place. Oddly enough, for a very long time, my uncles wouldn't answer me. But my grandmother told me once that when she'd be there early in the morning food prepping, she would hear a woman humming a tune in the added on dining room. Eventually, in my later teen years, I got a couple of uncles to open up about the place. They always prefaced these conversations with, well, I'm just crazy. But one of my uncles told me he saw a little boy running in the kitchen early one morning. And another told me he saw what looked like a priest wearing a cloth mask, just standing behind the glass window in a door that led from the kitchen to the dining room area. Needless to say, the stories always gave me goosebumps and the memory I had as a child. Well, I just took it as me being a young, scared child. Until one morning, at this point in my life, I was 17 years old. I stayed in an older house up the road from my family's restaurants, and I lived by myself for a couple of years as my mother had moved in with a new boyfriend she met who lived about an hour away. At this point, it was pretty routine I would stay up all night on my PC or Xbox, and when 3 a.m. rolled around, I knew my uncle would be down there making the sauce for a couple of days to store in the walk-in refrigerator. I'd be hungry, and go snack on a few things while we would visit. This morning was the same. I walked in and greeted him, my uncle Peter, who was a local volunteer firefighter and avid Second Amendment believer. He always had a pistol on his hip, 
while being down there alone. I walked to a refrigerator, got some cheese and peppers, and we started talking. After talking for a few minutes, we heard what sounded like someone running from the entrance dining area to the main dining room, full sprint, where they stopped. We both glared at each other, and he told me to go around the front to flank anyone there, and he would go in straight to the dining room from the kitchen entrance, gun and flashlight drawn. I slowly creeped through the door, heart pounding, and I saw his light and heard him say, whoever's in here, come out, I have a gun. There's a ramp that leads down into the dining room with a rail that's full wood all the way to the floor, like a mini wall. We didn't see anyone in the dining room, so figured they'd be behind there. But when we looked, nothing. Suddenly, we heard a loud bang come from where we were in the kitchen. So we ran back up there, all the metal ladles had been taken off their racks and thrown onto the metal steam tables that hold the food during the day during business hours. We looked everywhere, even went outside. We never found a thing. There's always been something about that place that has had a bigger part on my life than I feel I can put into words. A funny little side story is this. When I was in kindergarten, I went to a school not far from the restaurant. One morning, my mom dropped me off and headed for work. I walked into a dark classroom and got scared once again and ran out crying for my mom, just knowing she had just left me thinking I was okay. I must have been truly hysterical, but as I exited the place and ran a bit ways down the road, there she was, waiting on me. I remember her telling a friend later that day she just felt like something was wrong and to wait. The restaurant is still there and thriving till this day. After lots of family issues and going through COVID, it's been a life giver and a reminder of things forgotten and lost. It reminds me that things hold much more weight than the human eye can see.